on uh, Facebook Live. So please do share. Um, we are recording this event. Um, and so we will have the recording available afterwards. So again, my name is, is Dr. Mary McNabb. Um, I'm very excited about this event today. We're gonna have four panel discussions, all looking at the area of cannabis um, and the pandemic. Um, so these are our speakers today, um, and I'll move into uh, a little bit more of a description about the event. Oops. So <clears throat> basically, but why I wanted to uh, organize this event is there's a lot of interesting research going around about cannabis and COVID-19 from preclinical perspectives, um, also population epidemiological level studies looking at the impact of COVID-19 on medical cannabis patients and consumers. So we'll be reviewing um, the second panel, looking at uh, research studies from Dr. Vido and myself around that topic. Um, and then we're also really interested in, in understanding where the clinical realities are of um, how COVID-19 is impacting medical cannabis patients. So we'll dive into that. And then finally round out the event with um, some industry perspectives from the cannabis industry, uh, looking at uh, literature reviews done around the topic and around some public health uh, recommendations. So let's just get to it. Um, each panel, um, as I mentioned, will be uh, 30 minutes um, long. And uh, the first one, we're starting off with um, Dr. Igor uh, Kobolchek, uh, Dr. Mahesh Mahan, and uh, Professor, uh, Professor Mahesh Mahan. Um, and Erica Tangi, who is our uh, Cannabis Center of Excellence um, lead. So I'll go ahead and hand it over um, to you, Erica. I'll stop my screen share and my video and uh, hand it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Marian. My name is Erica Tangney and I'm here from the Cannabis Center of Excellence. And I'm here to moderate this panel of scientists conducting important preclinical work in the field of cannabis, specifically relating to its implications managing symptoms of COVID-19. Our first panelist is Dr. Igor Kovalchuk. Dr. Kovalchuk is a professor of biological sciences at the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada. He serves as the CEO of Pathway RX, a research company focused on developing custom cannabis therapies. He will be sharing his findings from a preprint study, which discusses the promise of certain cannabis strains to reduce inflammation in artificial human tissue. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Kovalchuk. I will hand it off to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Do you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Um, I am able to share the screen, right? Okay. Do you see my screen? We do not, Doctor. You will uh, have to try screen sharing uh, and clicking OK once you select the window you want to share. We now see your screen. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, the window just was not there. So. <laughs> Um, I don't that we uh, we're only seeing your Microsoft Excel. Is that what you want to show us? You might not no, want uh, for some reason the You're gonna want to stop the screen share doctor When you go to begin the screen share you're gonna have options as to which window you're presenting Make sure you pick the one with your slides. Yeah, I think the problem was I had too many open and this simply it didn't show up on the screen so. We are now seeing the correct window. You may go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I just want to say that uh, both papers have been accepted for publication, so they're no longer preprints. Preprints are still there, out there, but they both have been accepted in the Journal of uh, Aging, or Aging are just Aging, right? So uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, our research on developing hybrids uh, of cannabis sativa for a variety of purposes and uh, uh, their potential use for COVID-19. Uh, uh, again, it's a disclaimer, I am professor at the University of Lethbridge, but I'm also associated with uh, companies that have funded the research. Um, so as you know, um, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS virus uh, interacts uh, with uh, 
uh, some of our tissues, uh, so-called gateway tissues, based on the availability and expression of uh, ACE2 receptor on the surface, right? So, so this is one of the requirements uh, for the virus to get into our tissues. That's how the virus is tissue specific. So when it gets in and starts uh, the infection, there are certain tissues that are predominantly affected. So it's nasal, lung, and uh, intestine. But other tissues may also be targeted. They also have the ACE2 expression. So um, the ACE2 is a requirement and specific protease, TMPRSS2, that cleaves the uh, interacting uh, spike protein uh, is also partially required for successful injection. So again, certain tissues are more uh, affected than uh, the others. So what happens basically, uh, if you look at the lung uh, uh, epithelium uh, tissues, uh, in normal situation, you have circulating uh, uh, immune cells that release certain factors. So everything is uh, normal. As soon as you have the uh, uh, infection, you have a release of uh, cytokines uh, and uh, partial depletion of the uh, uh, T cells um, and um, well, symptoms associated uh, uh, with the disease like fever, cough, and you name it. Uh, in the severe cases, you have development of cytokine storms, so the massive production of various TNF interleukins uh, and uh, massive depletion of the uh, uh, immune cells and therefore uh, big problems leading to uh, organ failures. So it's then, um, you can hypothesize that basically the ability to uh, somehow downregulate the receptor for binding and the ability to fight or prevent the cytokine storm uh, would be very beneficial for uh, prevention or the development of severe cases of disease uh, uh, or complications and possibly deaths. Uh, so before COVID, what we've done in the lab, we have created a number, uh, it's nowadays stands for uh, over 1,500 of hybrids uh, between uh, marijuana and hemp. And we use an agnostic approach where we just uh, uh, collected the uh, flowers, made extracts, and tested for all sorts of purposes, including uh, cancer, so that we patented uh, uh, the uh, lines for anti -cancer, with anti-cancer properties, as well as various uh, inflammation, uh, skin conditions, uh, uh, in different uh, tissues. So by the time when COVID started, we accumulated data on uh, what varieties can be good for um, anti-inflammatory purposes. And so uh, we then uh, used uh, different 3D tissues, as you see here, depicted here, they are actual engineered tissues, but they are uh, actual real human tissues. And we have induced inflammation through various uh, means uh, with lipopolysaccharides, with TNF, interferon, UV, and, and then basically uh, observed uh, whether we have induction of ACE2 uh, or induction of pro-inflammatory cytokines, basically just mimicking what happens in COVID-19. And, and then we would uh, add our extracts and test which extracts are able to decrease the expression of ACE2 and which extracts are able to prevent the development of the uh, cytokine storm. I, I'll show only a little bit of data here and there because it's, it's a massive amount of it. But in this picture, for example, you see uh, the uh, 3D tissues, uh, collected protein, uh, and that's how we uh, uh, identify protein with uh, um, antibodies, so so-called Western blot. So you have an, uh, an, a treatment with a carrier and then treatment with extracts. And you see without even induction of inflammation, uh, we have uh, extracts that are clearly reducing the expression of ACE2 uh, 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 in, uh, in the targeted tissue, right? So um, this picture uh, demonstrates the effect of uh, anti-inflammatory effects so when we have induced inflammation, so we tested all genes and pathways uh, of the inflammation. And these varieties, for example, show that um, a massive reduction in the expression of TNF, interferon, cytokines uh, of uh, different uh, type. And as you see, not all uh, extracts are good. So for example, 15 uh, doesn't do anything. 
uh, and uh, extra 12 can actually have an opposite effect, uh, which is uh, uh, important because you have to remember that uh, not all cannabis extracts are good, right? So in this experiment, we mimicked uh, uh, the induction of inflammation with UV and uh, CCC by, by expression of interleukin and COX-2 uh, as indication of the infection uh, and inflammation. And uh, when we apply extracts, we reduce the amount of uh, uh, interleukin and COX-2 down to the pre-induction. So fairly rapidly within 24 hours. So, and as you see, some of the extracts are, are have an opposite effect. So again, it is important to test uh, which one is good and which one is not. And these extracts are already pre-selected extracts that demonstrated the anti-inflammatory properties in other conditions in other tissues. Um, this slide, for example, shows the cytokine-cytokine receptor interaction. So part of the cytokine storm and the uh, line four, as you see the, uh, all this green, uh, reduces the expression of major cytokines and we believe it would prevent the cytokine storm or, or carb it. Um, and as you see, for example, line 12 that I mentioned, mentioned does opposite. So both lines are high CBD varieties. So you have to be careful uh, what you use. So without uh, preclinical data, it, it may be dangerous. Um, in addition, for example, we use epi airway tissues, right? So again, we induce the uh, uh, expression of ACE2, right? So, and then we did either single cannabinoid treatment or extract. So the, uh, the full flavor, let's say extracts with cannabinoids and terpenes, and as you see, uh, all extracts are superior over single cannabinoids in uh, decreasing the ACE2 receptor. So very important. Uh, so-called entourage effect. So it means that uh, terpenes are required in the extract to modulate the effect. So basically what I showed you here is that uh, uh, there are uh, cannabis extracts that are able to decrease the ACE2 expression, potentially uh, reducing the risk of infection reducing the risk of development uh, of, of uh, symptoms and uh, side effects, uh, decreasing the cytokine storm. And uh, we have data where we dem can demonstrate that extra can prevent a certain degree induction of the cytokine storm by inflammation and, and infection. So um, we were, uh, you probably uh, know this data, but uh, I'll refer to them to the, to anyway. So it's an Israeli study. Uh, it's an early uh, result of the clinical trial where they use dexamethasone, CBD, and proprietary uh, terpenes and terpenes with combination in CBD to reduce uh, uh, cytokines, uh, uh, in, to inhibit cytokines. And they demonstrated that CBD easily beats uh, dexamethasone in the uh, decrease of interleukin TNA and TNF and even terpens alone are better than dexamethasone, and in combination, uh, they're the best. So, so they basically uh, uh, supported and confirmed uh, our finding as well. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. It's just the people who've done all the work and the companies that supported it. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions if there are any. Great, thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Kowalczyk. And if people have questions, you can put them in the chat. But my first question for you, Dr. Kowalczyk, is that um, from your preclinical work, uh, when people are going into the human clinical trials, what would you say are the top two lessons that researchers should take into consideration based on the research that you've done? So based on what, what we have done, uh, uh, I think it is important not to go blind and just pick anything. Uh, it is important to do at least, at least basic preclinical uh, uh, work. Um, um, I don't think you need uh, any toxicity studies because uh, we are operating with high CBD varieties and the amount of THC that is out there is uh, minimum, so there is no worry at all. But just to make sure that uh, the extract would be effective uh, one needs to test it uh, uh, in the lab. One can use also CBD, but uh, with the notion that uh, effect would be probably 50% or less of uh, uh, possible effect. 
Wonderful. And what do you recommend that we study next from a preclinical or a clinical perspective in relation to cannabinoid therapies and COVID-19? Well, there are so many directions, but I will tell you what we do now. So we have encountered the problem, for example, when uh, many companies and hospitals wanted uh, our lines for their research and clinical trials, and we realized we cannot send them to US. Uh, we, even with, uh, it will take from half a year up uh, to get all the permissions. And we decided, well, if we cannot send the extract, we can reconstitute the extract by identifying active ingredients. And we have advanced uh, towards identifying five uh, top ingredients that reconstitute the activity up to 90% and uh, in certain tissues. So, so that's what I would want to, uh, to, uh, to be used for uh, in, in the clinical trials. And, and now we just can provide uh, uh, the recipe and uh, any company can reconstitute it. So. I understand. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insight into this important work. Um, uh, we've reached time for this panelist, and so I'd like to now move on to our second panelist, uh, who is Doc. Thank you so much. Our second panelist today is Dr. Mahesh Mohan. He is a professor at the Southwest National Primate Research Center at the Texas Biomedical Research in Institute. Dr. Mohan recently published an article related to COVID-19 induced respiratory distress. He is here to discuss whether cannabinoids can be used in conjunction with antivirals for SARS-CoV-2 induced lung inflammation. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Mohan. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. And if people, while uh, watching Dr. Mohan's presentation, have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I can uh, ask at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Erica and Marion, uh, for the invitation to present uh, some of uh, our preclinical data that we've generated uh, using the rhesus macaque model. Uh, so, um, so our research mostly um, um, was done uh, during the last 10 years using the uh, rhesus macaque model of AIDS. And um, so uh, we, uh, I'll, for today, I'll basically talk about a mini commentary uh, we published in the July issue of uh, Brain Behavior and Immunity, where we highlighted the uh, potential effects, beneficial effects of cannabinoids, both uh, THC and CBD, in alleviating um, SARS-CoV-2 induced uh, lung and systemic inflammation. Um, as you can see from uh, this figure, um, you know, the virus, uh, which is uh, SARS-CoV-2, enters the uh, body via the nasal root inhalation, reaches the lung and, um, and reaches the lung through the trachea and bronchus, uh, infects both uh, type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes and initiates a localized and a systemic inflammatory reaction um, driven by a, a cytokine storm uh, leading to interstitial pneumonia, alveolar epithelial cell death, and, and the more serious uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, so COVID-19 is now considered a vascular disease and, and, and where there is significant vascular endothelial dysfunction, uh, pulmonary uh, venous and arterial thrombosis that can lead to stroke and, and more serious complications. So several independent studies uh, focused on the lung have shown uh, protective effects of cannabinoids on uh, LPS-induced uh, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine production and, and, and even fibrosis. Uh, so what is interesting is that uh, you know, we have documented similar uh, protective effects of cannabinoids, uh, especially THC, uh, in another viral infection, namely um, HIV AIDS, uh, using the Indian rhesus macaque model. So we wrote this mini review uh, based on the findings of others uh, that use rodent models of respiratory disease and our rhesus macaque model of uh, HIV infection. Uh, so therefore, in the uh, next set of slides, uh, I will briefly go over some of the um, uh, the critical data we have generated uh, on the anti-inflammatory effects of uh, cannabinoids, uh, in particular THC, and make the case that uh, majority of these findings uh, will find applications uh, for COVID-19 treatment. Um, so shown here is the, uh, the design of our uh, THC HIV studies, uh, uh, focused on the intestine, uh, the microbiome, and the brain. Um, now, uh, Again, uh, keep in mind um, that uh, even though COVID uh, infects the lung, it also infects the intestine. And um, this mini commentary uh, shown on the top, uh, published in eBiomedicine, was um, uh, uh, basically focused on the microbiome. 
Now, this will apply to obese patients that have uh, dysbiosis. And um, uh, so when, when co co we, we also have evidence in the rhesus macaque that uh, the virus can infect the intestinal epithelial cells. And uh, when there is dysbiosis, there is epithelial cell death. And as you can see from uh, here, um, the, the, the dysbiotic bacteria can translocate to the uh, systemic circulation and then cause uh, systemic immune activation. And, and drive uh, inflammatory cytokine production. So uh, shown here at the bottom is our, um, uh, our, our experimental design. We initiate uh, THC treatment at 0.18 mix per kg body weight, about one month before we infect them with SIV. And then on the uh, day of SIV infection, we increase the dose to 0.32 mix per kg. And then we uh, continue this treatment. It's basically twice daily treatment for about six months. And then we necropsy all the animals at six months. So here uh, you look, you know, what you see here is the, the viral loads uh, in the two groups. Uh, uh, you know, one group gets vehicle and the other group gets THC. Both groups uh, are infected with SIV. We don't really see any difference in the peak viremia uh, around day 14 post infection. So uh, THC uh, or cannabinoids in general uh, really don't have any impact on, uh, on systemic viral loads. But then when we look at the, uh, the T cell activation status, uh, so uh, HIV or SIV, which is the, um, the simian counterpart of HIV, uh, infects a certain cell type called CD4 T cells. And by two weeks, if you look here, uh, you know, the CD4 T cells are significantly depleted. And then uh, you know, it's never restored even up to six months post-infection. And as the CD4 T cells decline, the CD8 T cells begin to increase. But then when you look at the, uh, the, the percentage of cells that express KI67, uh, within the surviving population, you can clearly see a difference. You know, the K67 expressing cells shown here uh, in, uh, you know, for the THC group in blue um, um, squares and, and, and red circles for the vehicle group, uh, you see a big difference here. Um, so there are fewer KI67 uh, expressing cells uh, in, the, in the THC group, and same is the case um, uh, with the CD8 population too. Um, you know, uh, around peak viremia, which happens on day 14, you know, the THC uh, administered animals had uh, reduced expression of KI67, which again, uh, you know, tells you that THC is having a significant effect on T cell activation uh, based on KI67 expression. This is one of the mechanisms by which uh, THC, you know, reduces inflammation, you know, uh, reducing T cell proliferation. And then we also looked at another marker, which is uh, programmed death one, and you can see a big difference between the vehicle and the THC treated animals around six months post infection. And we see that with both CD4 and CD8 T cells. Uh, we also looked at uh, a third uh, marker of activation, which is HLA-DR. You know, in general, if you look, the vehicle treated animals have higher expression of HLA-DR compared to the, uh, the THC treated animals, which is shown on the bottom. And then we also looked at the anti-inflammatory macrophage population, which is CD163. And you can clearly see that the anti-inflammatory, uh, you know, CD163 uh, expressing macrophages uh, are present uh, at, at higher numbers uh, in the THC uh, treated group. Uh, next, we looked at the brain. Um, because HIV also um, you know, infects the brain. Um, um, about 50% um, of the uh, infected patients uh, develop a condition called HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, uh, and, and it persists even in people who receive antiretroviral therapy. And if you look, and we focused on the basal ganglia, um, which is a target of HIV, and if you can clearly see here, uh, there's a significant uh, reduction in the number of upregulated genes in the THC uh, you know, administered group, there's a 1.54 reduction. And if you look at uh, uh, several of these interferon stimulated and, and, and pro-inflammatory genes, these are all upregulated in the, in the vehicle treated group, but not in the THC treated group. And when we did the uh, functional annotation clustering, you can see a lot of these genes belong to, uh, you know, the inter, uh, you know, uh, functional groups such as cellular response to interferon beta, uh, positive regulation of interferon beta production, uh, but we don't see that uh, in the um, in the in the THC treated group. Uh, so there is a significant blunting of the interferon response uh, in the brain. And, and this table here shows you a list of interferon stimulated genes. And if you look to the right here, um, in terms of read count and fold change, uh, the TA treated is significantly you know, um, high expression. Even the read counts are higher uh, in the vehicle group compared to the uh, THC group. 
Uh, and this table here shows uh, a list of interferon stimulated genes that perform antiviral function. And then these are all suppressed in the THC group. Uh, I mean, this can have pros and cons because, you know, these uh, antiviral uh, genes, uh, you know, their function is to uh, suppress viral replication. So if THC is suppressing, um, you know, the expression of these genes, then that gives the virus an upper hand to replicate. And, 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 and so when we looked at the viral loads in the, um, in the brain of these THC-treated mechanics, we're seeing higher viral loads uh, in the brain of THC-treated animals. So uh, that's why in the, um, in, in the um, mini commentary that we wrote, we, we basically recommended that cannabinoids be added to antiviral therapies and not uh, uh, you know, given alone so that you know, while cannabinoids can take care of the inflammation, the, the antivirals will take care of the viral replication so you get uh, maximum benefit. And, and, and here, uh, so this is again evidence of um, uh, combining, uh, you know, antiretroviral drugs uh, with uh, THC. So here we initiate an antiretroviral therapy around day 14 post-infection. And as the viral loads come down, if you look here, uh, the CD4 T cells started coming back. Um, and, and again, if you look, uh, the THC treated animals have, you know, reduced uh, percentage of CD4 T cells, and again, the KI67 expressing uh, CD4 T cells are lower uh, in the in the THC treated group, uh, suggesting that you know THC is exerting anti-inflammatory effects by inhibiting T cell proliferation. Now, uh, a lot of COVID-19 patients after recovery, you know, they have uh, they feel tired, um, they have uh, you know difficulty breathing. They're not able to climb stairs. So um, after recovery, uh, you know, there are some lasting lesions in the lung, like fibrosis. And, and fibrosis is also common in, in HIV infection, especially uh, you see it in the lymph nodes and also in the heart. And as you can see here, uh, all this blue material that you see in the lymph follicles are all uh, collagen uh, deposition. And we see significant amounts of collagen deposition in, 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 in SIV-treated animals that receive vehicle, but we don't see that uh, in the THC-treated animals. And uh, when we quantified it, uh, you can see clear uh, differences in, in, in the blue staining. Uh, there are significantly uh, low levels of collagen in the lymph nodes of uh, THC-treated animals. So how does THC uh, um, uh, perform its um, antifibrotic effects? I mean, we looked at uh, the expression of an antifibrotic transcription factor called PPAR gamma, stands for peroxisome proliferator activator receptor gamma. And if you look here, the shown here, uh, you know, starting with the T, it stands for THC, V here stands for vehicle. And when we quantified the expression, all this green staining is peroxisome proliferator activator receptor gamma. And, and when we quantified it, you can see significantly high expression of PPAR gamma in the THC treated group. And here we did an immunofluorescence on the lymph nodes, and you can see the expression is high in these B cells um, shown here um, in, in far red, and the green is PPAR gamma. Uh, and, and we also did uh, another, uh, uh, you know, technique called luciferous reporter assays to show that both THC and CBD can activate PPAR gamma. And, and the expression of PPAR gamma is significantly higher in, in the jejunal epithelium. And even in, in, in in vitro cell culture, when you treat them with THC, PPAR gamma, show, you know, expression is increased. So we wanted to test this um, in vitro. So we harvested these lymph node fibroblasts and then pre-treated them with THC for an hour and then um, challenge them with TGF beta, which is a pro uh, fibrogenic cytokine. And as you can see here, the THC treated animals had reduced collagen synthesis shown here on the bottom, whereas the vehicle treated animals have, I mean, cells have, um, you know, high expression of collagen. So this is again, evidence that THC can, and can inhibit, um, you know, uh, the ability or in other words, block the ability of TGF beta to induce um, collagen synthesis. And, and at this point, we want to find out what the mechanisms are, what are the receptor um, associated mechanisms. Um, and, and so THC is exerting effects on the gut, uh, the brain. So uh, what kind of effects does it have on the microbiome? Uh, and this is an ongoing study. So I'll show you some data on the oral microbiome. What you see here is we basically uh, did a 16S ribosomal DNA uh, sequencing um, from um, saliva samples uh, collected at one, three, uh, five months, and also pre-infection uh, from these THC and vehicle treated animals. And uh, the take home message here is that when you look at the, um, uh, the, the Baker test, uh, 
the break out is distance here. Uh, the THC treated animals at five months post infection, they cluster closer to the pre infection shown here. PR stands for pre infection than the vehicle treated group, which means their microbiome you know, shares more similarity with the, with the pre infection time point. And uh, the other uh, take home message is that uh, we are seeing um, you know, a higher abundance of lactobacillus. Uh, and, 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 and carnobacteria. You know, these are common cells found in oral cavity and, they are abund and their um, uh, uh, levels are higher uh, in the THC treated group, uh, which means uh, THC is inhibiting inflammation and, and preventing you know, oral dysbiosis. And, and this is another uh, representation here, you know, shown in the vehicle group. So if you look in the vehicle group, um, all of these common cells uh, you know, carnobacteria, lactobacillus, and even granuli cuticala, I mean, granuli cutella, uh, all three are depleted uh, in the vehicle treated animals uh, compared to their pre infection time point. And we did not see this depletion. We, I mean, these were uh, basically maintained in the, in the THC treated animals. And here within the THC treated group, you know, two important pathogenic bacteria, Prevotella falcini and, and, and bacteria belonging to the family Porphyromonas. Uh, these are all periodontal pathogens, and their uh, relative abundance is actually low uh, in the THC treated animals uh, compared to the pre infection time point. And uh, when we compare the vehicle and THC groups, you know, we're seeing um, you know, um, higher uh, abundance of uh, these common cells, lactobacillus, carnobacteria, and reduced abundance of, uh, uh, of pathogenic bacteria like uh, Catronella and Mannheimer. So, uh, THC certainly is having an effect on the microbiome. And this is something that we are um, uh, further studying. Uh, we're also looking at the intestine right now and, and we'll have, uh, we have some data, but uh, we're still, uh, uh, we've decided to do a, a more a detailed analysis of uh, like metagenomic uh, profiling. Uh, so, uh, so that's the story with the uh, with the HIV. And, and so now we're all set to uh, test uh, cannabinoids in our uh, uh, a COVID-19 model, and, and we have developed uh, um, a, a, an NHP model of COVID-19. As you can see here, uh, we, we have a rhesus macaque model and a baboon model, and we can see significant inflammation in the lung um, of both uh, rhesus macaques and um, uh, baboons. You know, baboons uh, generally show a, a, a more severe pathogenesis. And, and we also tested the Regeneron antibodies that uh, President Trump received. Uh, uh, this was all tested here, and, and, and we did a, a prophylactic as well as um, a, a therapeutic study. And as you can see here, um, you know, a, a dose of 50 milligrams was able to um, you know, prevent um, inflammation in the lung. And similarly, uh, this is as a prophylactic dose, and as a therapeutic dose, again, uh, 150 milligrams was able to protect uh, the lung uh, from inflammation and also infection. Um, so overall, um, you, know, um, um, you know, our data shows that um, you know, cannabinoids exerted uh, significant anti-inflammatory effects in the, in the intestine, brain, and oral cavity. And in the brain, uh, you know, the mechanisms uh, involve uh, reducing cytotoxicity and oxidative stress. Uh, one uh, issue that we saw was the reduced uh, expression of interferon-stimulated antiviral genes. Now, this can uh, give the virus uh, an upper hand. So this has been shown even um, in the, this has been actually uh, confirmed uh, with the flu virus too. So I would expect the same with SARS-CoV-2. So it's always uh, 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 advisable to combine cannabinoids with antiviral therapies. And, and, and long-term THC also had a probiotic-like effect in the oral cavity, you know, maintaining uh, the relative abundance of lactobacilli and carnobacteria. And, and we have successfully developed an NHP model of COVID-19 and, and pretty soon, uh, you know, we've submitted a couple of grants um, to study the uh, effect of um, uh, THC and other cannabinoids on, on COVID-19 pathogenesis, and hopefully uh, we'll get one of those grants. Um, and finally, I want to thank all my lab members, uh, my collaborators at uh, LSU um, Health Science Center, Stony Brook, and uh, the University of Nebraska. And finally, um, a big thanks uh, uh, and acknowledgement to, to NIH, especially NIDA for uh, funding all our uh, projects, uh, our previous and current projects. Thank you. And I'll take any questions you have. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohan, for presenting uh, your findings. That was really interesting. I think we have time for one question, which I will field from the audience here. And we have a question about the role of collagen when deposited in the lymph nodes, which is, as you said, reduced in the presence of THC or CBD. Right. And it seems 
the presence of fibrosis in lymph node follicles can inhibit one's ability to fight infection in the future. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the lymph node follicles, uh, and that is the site where um, the immune response occurs, um, you know, CD4 T cell, I mean, um, you know, antigen presenting cells, you know, after they process the antigen, like dendritic cells, they provide antigen to the, uh, you know, other T cells. So if you have collagen deposited there, then that will interfere with immune response. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, collagen deposition is an irreversible process. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, that can be uh, very damaging. And, 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 and lymph node fibrosis is also a problem um, in, in cancer patients. So when I presented this data at the NIH last year, um, uh, one of the attendees was very, um, you know, um, excited to see this data because he was an oncologist and uh, his patients, mostly breast cancer patients, were, uh, you know, when they were being treated with chemotherapy therapeutic agents, you know, they, he was seeing increased uh, fibrotic uh, changes in in the breast and in other, uh, you know, parts of the body, and he thought this was, uh, you know, a, a, a good strategy to to prevent, um, you know, collagen deposition. So fascinating. Well, thank you so much for taking our question. Uh, we've hit time for this panel. Thank you so much to Drs. Kovalchuk and Mohan for your time. And now I would like to pass the mic over to Dr. Marian McNabb, who is moderating our second panel about population and public health research. Thank you so much to you both. Awesome, thank you. Uh, thank you both and thank you, Erica. That was very, very interesting uh, preclinical work, and I think very, very important for us to understand where the science is around that. Um, now we're gonna move into the second panel, <clears throat> which is looking at um, the impact of COVID-19 from an epidemiological and a population level um, to understand uh, impact of COVID-19 on medical cannabis patients and cannabis consumers. Um, so during this next 30 minute session, um, I'm really excited to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Denise Vito, um, who will present the first uh, part of her work, and then I will follow up uh, with a presentation um, uh, myself. So uh, turning to Dr. Vito, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Denise Vito is currently an assistant professor at the university, um, at the as assistant professor in the School of Nursing and Health Sciences at the University of Miami. Dr. Vito's research interest is centered around um, physical health outcomes of substance use and abuse across the lifespan uh, among racial and ethnic minority populations. She also examines cardiovascular and metabolic outcomes among cannabis users from an epidemiological perspective and is interested in cardiovascular and metabolic health outcomes among HIV uh, patients uh, who use cannabis. Um, so uh, Dr. Vito has recently launched a um, cannabis uh, and COVID-19 study. So really appreciate you, uh, Dr. Vito, for being here today. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen and you can uh, start sharing yours. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. Um, I will start sharing my screen here. All right. So. Hopefully you can see my screen. May I have confirmation, please? We yes. can. Go ahead, doctor. Fantastic. Well, today I am going to be talking about the Cannabis Health and Fitness Study. This is an international study with over 3,000 participants, and we, have, we are entering our third wave of data collection right now. One thing I want to start with is, of course, first, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And... Um, I also want to highlight my collaborating affiliations. Nothing can be done in silos, especially when regard to population epidemiology. So I'd like to give a huge congratulations and thank you to my collaborators at SUNY Downstate, UNC Chapel Hill, and also University of Texas Health. So today we're gonna to be talking about the relationship between cannabis. I'm going to be changing my screen. Sorry about that. Hold on a second. Let's jump back on here. Can you still see my screen? Not right now, no doctor. All right, sorry about that. Here we go. Great. So, um, can you see my full screen or just the smaller screen? Uh, you're not in presentation mode, but, oh, we lost it again. It wouldn't be a Zoom presentation if it wasn't spicy. <laughs> so true. <laughs> 
Yep, hold on one second, please. I just want to be respectful and show my face on the camera. Okay, so how about now? If not, I'll go ahead and remove my video. But can you see the screen? No, we could see your video and the presentation before. Um, we can only see your video now. You should be good to do just what you were doing before. Okay, great. Thank you kindly. All right, here we go again. So again, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. We cannot see your screen now, oh. doctor. I'm, it keeps going away, I'm so sorry. You might have to try one more time to screen share the presentation. All right, hold on one second, please. That's perfect. You don't have to click anything else other than present on your PowerPoint and you're good to go. All right. Mm -hmm. Great. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So today we're going to be talking about the endocannabinoid system and especially how cannabis can interact with COVID-19. Most likely I will be talking about preliminary results from our international study, but I'm going to be focusing majority on the United States results. So before I start, I know the audience here is very diverse. So I just wanted to bring everyone to baseline and talking about the importance of why it matters to talk about cannabis, particularly when it comes to COVID-19. So first of all, not all cannabis is created equal. As you can see here, there are many routes that we can use to ingest cannabis, ranging from smoking all the way down to oral mucosal. The thing is, is that it really matters how you ingest cannabis. And the reason why it matters is due to what we call the endocannabinoid system. In our bodies, we already have systems that exist, circulatory system, respiratory system. We learn about this beginning in elementary school. But the human endocannabinoid system is a system that's not often talked about, particularly in medical school. And I personally was never taught about it in my training along the way. Uh, I am a cannabis epidemiologist. And one of the things that our lab, my lab focuses on is characterizing the brain, heart, and gut access among cannabis consumers. And we do this using both clin clinical and also population-based studies. The thesis of our lab is based on these organs and also the human endocannabinoid system. And looking at these organs, so in particular the brain, heart, and gut, we can see that there are two main types of receptors. There is the CB1 receptor and CB2 receptor. These receptors are important in the endocannabinoid system because this is the vehicle to which cannabis impacts our body. So THC is one of the cannabinoids that is typically found in what we consider the adult use slash recreational. Typically medicinal cannabis has a higher uh, ratio of CBD or CBN. And as you can see from this figure here, depending on the cannabinoid, you will be able to tell how the, um, the organ will recept this. So this model here, and I apologize for going fast, but I realized that I missed out on the beginning part of the time. So please feel free to slow me down if so. But this model here is really the premise behind why we thought to look into COVID-19. So here we're looking, if you look at the top of the figure, you'll see two red indications here, 2AG and AEA. Those are endocannabinoids. Those are already in our body, endogenous cannabinoids, I should say. THC and CBD are what we call phytocannabinoids. So these are cannabinoids that come from external sources, in this case, the plant cannabis. So due to that mechanism of action, and one important thing to note about that mechanism of action is that it eventually leads to, as we saw in our previous uh, presentations, immune regulation, um, cell growth, differentiation, et cetera. So on March 11th, when COVID-19 was declared a pandemic in the world, my lab immediately thought of our patients. Uh, we have five ongoing primary collection data um, studies going on, three of which are within HIV patients. And one of the resounding things that our patients were discussing was, where will we get access to cannabis? Uh, you know, what's gonna happen and, and things like that. So considering vulnerable populations, including those with chronic health conditions were highlighted as a special population that should take precautions to avoid exposure. We think of it as medicinal cannabis consumers, by having that medical prescription, by definition, there's a chronic health condition to which you have the qualified. So in 11 days and 10 days later, March 21st, we launched the COVID-19 International Cannabis Health Study. 
And our real purpose of this was to just provide observational real-time epidemiologic data to really measure what was going on among cannabis consumers in the context of this pandemic. And looking at these numbers, I went ahead and pulled this straight from Johns Hopkins University this morning. Uh, as of 1026 AM, we can see that we have over 68 million cases of COVID-19. And the United States is number one in the world. So it's very relevant that we discuss possible ways to mitigate the impact of this pandemic on our nation and in the world. In looking at the mortality data that we've seen up to date, we are pretty clear that those who have Corbin, uh, comorbidities have higher chances of mortality. One thing to note here is also those who have risk factors such as smoking. And as some previous presenters mentioned, smoking is a primary uh, route of administration, especially among humans. So it is very interesting to see how cannabis consumers are responding to the pandemic. Here you can see the, our three research questions to our study. We are not gonna focus on all of them today, but I do wanna highlight the patterns, routes, and frequencies of use amid the pandemic, and also the prevalence of testing um, and behaviors. So for, uh, in brief, our methods, we conducted an internet-based uh, survey. It was administered to everyone over the age of 18. They had to um, endorse cannabis use for medicinal purposes or non-medicinal purposes. Um, of note, our first wave only included medicinal cannabis consumers, and then about midway through the wave, we added the option for recreational consumers. So the data that I'm presenting today is about from about 1,500 participants, and this is from the first wave, so looking from March 21st until July 10th. To date, we have, again, I mentioned we're launching our third wave, so more data to be uh, seen. If you're interested in looking at the actual measure, feel free to look at the NIH website on the Fenex toolkit because our questionnaire is listed there and please feel free to implement in your own studies because so we can compare. Looking here, this is a quick depiction of our global respondents. Again, we're not gonna be focusing on international, but I do wanna let you know that as of July 10th, we had about 500 global respondents uh, and we are currently among data analysis. So what I'm presenting today is, again, on the 1,500 cannabis consumers. All of them are medicinal consumers. We did not look at the recreational uh, self-report. One thing to note here is that we have a pretty um, balanced male and female group here. However, the race ethnicity is not balanced. And I, and I have to start off as an epidemiologist in saying that the results that I'm presenting today are not generalizable to all populations. So as you can see from the demographics of those who responded to the survey, 80% of them were of non-Hispanic white race ethnicity. So in other studies that we've conducted, including many of them in my lab here in South Florida, we see that the majority of cannabis consumers are not only non-Hispanic white. So that is something very relevant to keep in mind in the context of these preliminary results that we're sharing with you today. So this makes me excited. The result, results here preliminary show that uh, we divided it into three main questions. The first question was, how has your dose changed since the start of the pandemic? Again, this is a cross-sectional survey, so we were unable to see if they were um, telling, being honest with their results. Uh, we were not measuring biological mechanisms to see the actual cannabinoid content in their you know, samples. So this is all self-report. However, based on this self-report, we can see that 39.2% of respondents, medicinal cannabis consumers across the United States have increased their cannabis consumption since COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. Also, about 4.9% said that health professionals recommended cannabis to manage COVID-19. And then about 7.9% said that a health professional suggested that they get an advanced supply of their medication. In looking at the respondents of our survey, we have divided it up based on the chronic health conditions. So as you can see from this figure here, 65.6% .6 of respondents reported mental health related chronic conditions to which they're using cannabis to, to manage. Second place of the highest prevalence is pain, chronic pain, um, and then third, cardiometabolic related disease. And within cardiometabolic related disease, we are including high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, heart disease. And as we know now, which we did not know at the beginning of the pandemic, those are the risk factors that uh, are of high, high interest when it comes to COVID-19. So some quick results, uh, when we looked at, we looked at some logistic regressions to look at the association between some of these outcomes and the um, presence of medicinal cannabis. 
So in looking at this, we see that mental health uh, consumers, so consumers who use cannabis to manage their mental health conditions, they have 76% higher odds of reporting increased cannabis use than other um, medicinal users. So again, we're adjusting this for age, gender, and educational level. When asked about whether or not they fear diagnosis of COVID-19, medicinal cannabis consumers with the following conditions reported more likely to report fear, respiratory related, immune related, and mental health related conditions. When asked about feeling isolated, have you isolated yourself from others due to the pandemic? Respiratory related chronic uh, disease medicinal users and also those with immune related conditions had a higher odds of um, reporting that they're more likely to isolate. When asked about the fear of uh, giving COVID-19 to someone else, so passing it on transmission behaviors, medicinal cannabis consumers with mental health conditions have 47% higher odds of reporting fear of giving COVID-19 to others, again, after adjusting for these covariates. Then when asked, do you currently have COVID-19 symptoms? Interestingly, respiratory related, mental health related, and chronic pain related chronic diseases are those that uh, had a higher um, odds of reporting these symptoms. When asked about whether or not they're worried about paying for their medication, so paying for their cannabis, those who have mental health related chronic conditions and those with chronic pain reported higher odds of uh, being worried about paying for their medication. And it was almost double the odds if you look at the confidence intervals. So what's important here to, to note is that yes, overall medicinal cannabis consumers with mental health conditions are reporting negative outcomes when it, or when it comes to the pandemic. But what does that really mean in the clinical population? One of my interests is looking at can cancer patients and how, especially the cancer patients who use cannabis to uh, deal with chemotherapy and some other reasons. So we conducted a subgroup analysis that was age matched. And what we did was we looked at those cancer patients, matched them with participants that were of the same age and analyzed similar outcomes. One thing to note here, we had a, a difference in male and female, whereas in the overall population, it was about 50-50 with males and female respondents. But when looking at cancer patients, 51% were female compared to only 35% um, within non-cancer patients who use medicinal cannabis. That may be important later on for net future directions, but it's an important thing to note. In addition, looking at the race ethnic differences, cancer consumers, there, were, there was a higher prevalence of those who were non-Hispanic Black and those who were Hispanic. So that's also something that's interesting to my team and I, and we can discuss why later. One of the keys, and I think if you stop listening to me right now, if you're a clinician, what I would like you to hear when it comes to COVID-19 and cannabis is that not all cannabis is created equal, number one, but secondly, when you have patients, for example, here, a cancer patient, we have to really think about what their comorbidities are, what they could be using cannabis to manage these comorbidities for. So for example, here, cancer consumers who use medicinal cannabis, 30.4% of them reported a co-occurring cardiometabolic disease of some sort, and that's compared to only 25% of non-cancer participants, patients. Same thing can say, um, but in the reverse, with respiratory-related conditions. So non-cancer patients who endorse medicinal cannabis use, 20% 20, 20 of them have respiratory-related conditions as well. Um, so this, of course, complicates matters when it comes to COVID-19. In looking at just the cancer patients, I really want to highlight here that there are differences in how these cancer patients are um, interacting when it comes to COVID-19 and, and cannabis. So number one, similar to the overall population, about 31.5% increased their dose. And this is a self-increase. So this is without the recommendation of a healthcare provider. Secondly, about 4% compared to 0% of cancer patients reported that a healthcare professional suggested cannabis be used to manage COVID-19. So that is very uh, interesting as well with regards to the epidemiology. And then when thinking about the advanced uh, supply again, Cancer patients had a higher prevalence, 16.4%, compared to only 4.4 non-cancer patients in which healthcare professionals recommended an advanced supply because of the pandemic. And then finally, what I would like to wrap up as far as results are concerned is that it's not only the fact that there are, uh, that cannabis, having cannabis, we have to think about the, how much patients are having, the advanced supply. So we're looking here and comparing the non-cancer patients and the cancer patients. Looking at the different colors, we can see here that the teal color is over three months. 
So cancer patients, over 20% of them endorsed having over three months supply, comparing that um, to, and then if you look at the two weeks, that's over 35%. Looking at the non-cancer patients, however, it's more distributed. So that's very intriguing to me considering um, how important cancer, the literature says cannabis is for cancer management, especially with chemotherapy. And then also method. I started off this talk talking about the various methods of cannabis consumption and why it is so important due to the endocannabinoid system. So in looking at these results here, we see that cannabis consumers, especially those that have cancer, are using it in various ways. And they've also changed their route due to the pandemic, which is quite interesting from a public health perspective. So number one, looking at the pipe and bowl, and I know earlier speakers were talking about smoking. So if we're looking at the first four colors here, we can see that before the pandemic, that was the most prevalent route of administration. Post pandemic or since the pandemic has been declared, now you can see edibles are, are more prevalent. Edibles, tinctures are now showing up. Those are the two that were not showing up prior, prior to the pandemic. And then finally with results, Again, cancer patients and cannabis consumers are not all the same. Some are also endorsing co-substance use. So for example, um, psilocybin. Psilocybin is something that's quite interesting to my lab and I. Also, we could see that alcohol and tobacco has increased looking at the red. That is very um, in line with the other literature. So we are not really surprised to see that. So for clinical implications here, our results show that medicinal cannabis used before um, it shows how cannabis has changed. It shows how patients are using cannabis in the middle of the pandemic. And it's important to note that anxiety and depression were the most prevalent chronic health conditions. And if we can just stop and think of what that really means in the context of this pandemic, and we're here entering a new year, um, it's, it's very, very important. Um, also, we should now be always asking our patients about cannabis consumption, especially amid the pandemic. Um, future directions should look at what the long-term implications are. And then finally, I love to leave off with a map. So one of the great things that epidemiologists love to use is showing data on visual representation. So here, this is again, just as of July 10th, our respondents, it's overlaid on the cases as of July 10th. So you can even see with this figure how drastic COVID has changed since July. But what I wanna show you here is that these are our respondents. And if you look at the dark color, that is showing that they have more than one chronic disease. And looking at the map, the majority of cannabis consumers have more than one chronic condition, which makes it complicated when it comes to COVID-19. Furthermore, it's important to note, if you look at, this is a pre-election last month map, but if you look at what states are legalized and what states are not, and then overlay that with our respondents, the green here are medicinal cannabis consumers. The orange are those who report uh, recreational use or adult use. The map does not match the use versus legality. So as an epidemiologist, one of the most important things that I wanna know in my lab and what I think all of us should be important thinking of is how are they using cannabis? Where are they getting cannabis from? What type of cannabinoids are in there? And how can we leverage the positive while reducing the negative impact of cannabis by focusing on the type of they use, the route they use, and where they get it from. Thank you so much for your time. I'd like to acknowledge my team. And if you want to read more information, we have a, a preliminary study published in the Journal of Addictive Diseases. And once again, thank you so much for this invitation. I love these types of conversations. And I yield. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Vito. That was fascinatingly interesting. Um, and I'm really glad that you went first because you laid some really great groundwork for understanding um, the benefits of medical cannabis in, in our body and the endocannabinoid system. And I, um, I'm really excited to now hear your findings. And we have um, you know, some similar findings from the study that, that we've conducted. So I'll just kind of jump right in and um, go ahead and share my screen. All right, can everybody see my screen? Grant, can you see my screen? You're good, Marion. All right, cool, thanks, Erica. All right, um, so to jump right in, um, so my name is Dr. Mary McNabb again. I am the president of Cannabis Center, for Center of Excellence. We're a 501c3 nonprofit 
organization uh, based out of Massachusetts that conducts cannabis research studies, education programs, and uh, focuses on social justice issues. So um, uh, similar to Dr. Vito, when uh, COVID-19 uh, epidemic hit, uh, we quickly decided to also um, launch a, a COVID-19 uh, survey, both of medical cannabis patients and uh, adult use consumers. So we launched this study together with UMass Dartmouth and it's approved by their institutional review board. Um, this is the uh, preliminary finding presentation. Um, our study is going on until um, August of next year as well, and we're really quite interested in looking at time trends, which I'm sure uh, Dr. Vito is as well. Um, so I would love to uh, pause here and give a special thanks to all of the uh, sponsors and study partners um, that we have. We couldn't do this work uh, without your support. Um, so Bridge City Collective, Cresco Labs, Good Chemistry, MCR Labs, uh, thank you all very much for being study partners uh, alongside Alternative Wellness Centers, Bass, Holistic Industries, Cure Leaf and Cultivate, um, and our study media partners, uh, Differently, Canawise, Sensi, and You Can. Uh, thank you all so much. Like I said, we couldn't do this work without you. Um, and as a disclaimer, although we, we do partner with these uh, wonderful companies, um, we do retain the sole discretion to publish our research findings, um, whether or not of the opinions of our sponsors. So I'll just jump right in. Uh, we started data collection uh, in May this year, and this is a report of 346 uh, respondents to our survey so far. Um, we have a heavy focus on Massachusetts residents. Um, and about a half of our sample is male and about 10% of our sample um, is veterans. Um, interestingly, uh, the halfway point or the average age of our sample is 41 years. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the differences in our age groups a little later in the presentation. Um, so we asked uh, folks that were consumers, how are they uh, consuming cannabis? Do they have a state licensed medical card and then they're licensed by a, uh, a recommended uh, 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 clinician and 47% said yes um, and 16% reported their adult use only 15% um, consume medically with a state card as well as adult use um, only um, and uh, both consume without a state card and recreationally is 13% I'm quite interested in understanding how people identify themselves as consumers or as medical medical patients so uh, in our sample, we asked um, what health conditions um, were cannabis, uh, is cannabis found to be most helpful for? Um, and similar to Dr. Vito's work, uh, overwhelming uh, majority is uh, anxiety at 73%, followed by a depression and mood, uh, then followed by chronic and severe pain at 55%, 52% um, insomnia. So we can see that, again, uh, similar to Dr. Vito, mental health, uh, conditions are one of the top reasons people are choosing medical cannabis. Um, but when we ask what is the top health condition for which you, you consume medical cannabis that's most helpful, uh, chronic and severe pain won this one, uh, followed very quickly by uh, anxiety at 23%, followed by depression at 19 and then insomnia. <clears throat> Um, we also ask uh, what kinds of symptoms for health conditions, um, you know, are you finding cannabis most helpful for? Uh, Top one, sleep, followed by anxiety, then pain and depression, and then following inflammation. Uh, but it's interesting because we've heard so much about the, the role of cannabis on inflammation um, from a scientific perspective. I wonder, um, you know, from a patient perspective, if they're aware about reporting uh, inflammation because they're self-reported outcomes. Um, so we asked generally um, how cannabis has improved um, the quality of life, um, and 82% report helps with psychological symptoms. 73% um, report generally helping with quality of life, and then 64% saying help with physical symptoms. Um, interestingly, um, you know, we also asked, um, you know, whether or not cannabis, um, you're kind of helping using cannabis to reduce the use of some other um, unwanted medications, um, and 45% said that cannabis currently helps them reduce the use of prescription medications. Uh, 42 reduce the use of alcohol. 38% um, reduce uh, the use of over-the-counter medications that are unwanted. 30% helping start ha helps to avoid starting um, medications. Um, and then 19% reducing tobacco. 16% reducing opiates. Um, so quite 
quite interesting. Um, and when we asked actually, you know, um, active right now reducing medication use, combining uh, both prescriptions and non-prescription uh, medications, 53% of our sample are using cannabis to reduce medication use. Um, interestingly, and I'm glad you uh, touched upon the change in uh, cannabis consumption, uh, Dr. Vito, as a result of COVID-19. Um, we uh, just asked what is their current uh, top cannabis uh, consumption method uh, given now within COVID-19. Um, and, and in our sample, um, it is uh, uh, still a flower uh, followed by edibles, uh, vape, et cetera. But again, our sample is, is concentrated in Massachusetts as well. So uh, different, different groups we're looking at. Um, when we look at, we asked uh, about access and cultivation at home. Um, it's legal to cultivate cannabis at home. Um, so after uh, COVID-19, 17% uh, of people uh, started to cultivate cannabis at home. And we also ask um, whether or not, you know, the uh, medical cannabis or cannabis, medical cannabis patients or consumers actually um, have been infected with COVID-19. 97% reported they were infected and received the results. 10% uh, thought they had COVID-19 but could not access a test and 12% um, currently have symptoms of COVID-19. Um, since, since the uh, pandemic has started, um, you know, uh, consumers and patients are obviously practicing social distancing more, feeling nervous on edge, very worried about contracting COVID-19, having uh, COVID-19, having uh, trouble relaxing and worrying too much, which is exacerbating the mental health conditions that uh, both Dr. Vito and her population and we've seen in ours. Um, and so, yes, uh, we asked, you know, has cannabis consumption increased? Uh, and 49% of our sample said they consume more cannabis now. Um, and additionally, 14% um, have switched their preferred method. 9% um, have uh, registered to get a state medical card. And we'll hear on our next panel a little bit more about that um, and the importance of that, um, particularly happening in Massachusetts. So <clears throat> when we look at barriers uh, to purchasing cannabis, both pre and post COVID, uh, post COVID um, money to obtain products has become a higher barrier as well as access to the right products. Uh, stigma has become reduced as a barrier, uh, place to consume cannabis reduced, money required to get a medical card reduced also probably because there's discount programs that are going on now um, and lack of healthcare provider involvement pointing to uh, similar pointings of, of Dr. Denise Vito's uh, research study. But interestingly, uh, workplace testing um, is also decreased, and I think we'll see that as a kind of a result of the change in employment status as, as uh, COVID-19 um, has happened and a lot have lost their jobs. So uh, we decided to look at age um, because, again, uh, you know, I, I feel like during COVID-19, um, this impacted uh, people very differently. Um, some people have had to homeschool their children. Some have had to uh, move in with their parents and take care of them. Um, and so, you know, we wanted to look at those differences uh, among age groups. So younger people uh, are reporting uh, more likely to use cannabis uh, for anxiety and depression um, and less likely um, to have a medical cannabis card in their state um, and less likely um, or more likely to use can cannabis for nausea or vomiting symptoms. Um, younger people were more likely to use cannabis for migraines and PMS symptoms. Um, obviously, older people might also, uh, women might be going through menopause, uh, which may also have some benefit of using medical cannabis. Um, more younger people are using uh, cannabis for ADHD, and less younger people are using cannabis for chronic pain. Um, when we look at the impact of COVID-19 among these different age groups, <clears throat> Um, more younger people are practicing social distancing. Um, maybe it's because they're more active in their lives or they're not, um, you know, uh, typically at home. Um, they're, younger people are feeling uh, more nervous and on edge than older folks, uh, 73 versus 55%. Uh, younger people are worrying too much uh, more and are reporting having trouble relaxing uh, more now because of COVID-19 than older populations. Um, younger people, 65% report being more concerned about contracting COVID-19 compared to older populations. Um, and 63% of younger people, more younger people, were reported uh, unable to leave the house during a stay-at-home order. Um, and younger people feel, 46% uh, feel more depressed over the last five days than older cohorts. And 36% reported losing their job 
uh, of younger people uh, compared to 18%. So what we can see is a, is a lot of life changes happening um, from so many perspectives. We have compounding comorbid health outcomes, um, but also forced to change lifestyle, lose income, um, you know, potentially have to move. Uh, and again, here we see the impact, um, you know, more younger people reported being quarantined, 23% had, had to learn how to homeschool children, 17% had to move or change their living situation, and 10% had to take care of elderly fam family members. So compounding your own health and your own life, uh, you're, you've got changes um, that are external to you that are, are forcing you to, to have to uh, cope differently. Um, again, more younger cannabis, uh, more younger users, 45% report using cannabis to help with the emotional effects of COVID-19, 20% can't afford a regular supply, 14% are now forced to purchase from unregulated sources, um, and 29% report no impact from COVID personally, but 47% of older people um, report a personal impact of COVID. Um, again, um, so younger people um, now reporting being more um, uh, observing mandata mandatory stay-at-home advisories. Uh, they're more likely to be essential workers, more likely to be unemployed and looking for, uh, for work. So I want to thank um, our study partners again. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. Um, appreciate the support not only for this study, but um, others that we've done throughout the years. Uh, so. Uh, very much uh, appreciate. And I know that we've kind of run over time, so I, I am sorry, Dr. Budeau, we won't be able to wrap up too much about our findings together, and I think we'll have to move on to the next panel. Um, but thank you again all for, um, for, for this session. So I'll hand it over now um, to panel three, um, which will be moderated by Grant Smith. Um, now we're gonna turn to the clinical impact of COVID-19 with two of my dear friends and leading clinicians, uh, Kira uh, Smith-Bolden. Thank you so much, Kira, for joining us. And Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you. Um, and to Kathleen McKinnon of Alternative Wellness Centers, um, we're really interested to hear what you're seeing on the clinical reality on the ground from patients. Um, now we've heard you know, sort of what, what we're seeing at the population epidemiological level, and I'd love to hear um, if that has any, any um, it's sounding resonations from what you're seeing at the clinical level. Yes, very much so. So I hand yeah. it over to you, Grant. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. McNabb, and very, very honored to have both Kibra and Kathleen with us uh, today. My name is Grant Smith-Ellis, and uh, I am both a host at the Young Jerks along with, um, I guess I wear a lot of hats in the grassroots community in Massachusetts, but one of the things I like doing is uh, advising the Cannabis Center of Excellence, and I'm very grateful to Dr. McNabb and all the presenters uh, who have joined us for this event today. Um, you'll forgive me for any hiccups. I'm on double duty, both broadcasting and moderating this panel at the same time, so thank you to my guests for the indulgence. Uh, before we begin, I want to both ask uh, Kibra and then Kathleen to uh, introduce uh, themselves and the work that uh, they do, and then we'll get into a few questions about the pandemic and how it's impacted that work. Okay, um, Kathleen, I'll let you go first. <laughs> Hi, Key Brad. Nice to see you again. Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> um, my name is Kathleen McKinnon. Um, first, I want to thank um, Marion, uh, Dr. McNabb, for uh, inviting me to this presentation. And I want to thank Grant for being here and moderating and also for his work in the community. He keeps us very well informed, um, and we really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Um, I own Alternative Wellness Centers. I've been working in the cannabis industry here in Massachusetts since it went medical, um, and that started in 2013, uh, after, you know, after it was voted in in 2012. So I helped to kind of build um, the nation's, uh, what, what was the nation's largest um, cannabis certification center. Uh, I helped to create their educational platform. I left that company about a year and a half ago and started my own wellness company, and we're focusing on patient care, total body health and wellness, uh, mind, body, and spirit. And we believe that, you know, that natural medicine and alternative medicine uh, plays a big role in bringing people to their maximum wellness options for themselves. 
Okay, and my name is Kibra Smith Bolden. I'm from uh, New Haven, Connecticut, and I am the owner of Canna Health. We too are uh, medical cannabis certifying centers. Um, we focus our attention on inner city um, and, and making sure that people who normally don't have access to safe plant-based medicine are able to access it. Um, and we have been successful in um, certifying thousands of patients in Connecticut and now outside of Connecticut. And I'm really proud of the work that we do. We're, we're helping people to uh, look at cannabis in a new way, um, to understand cannabis in a new way, and, and again, provide access to safe medicine. So really proud of the work that we do. And proud to be on the panel with Kathleen. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. McNabb and Grant, for um, inviting me today. Oh, thank you both so much for being with us. Um, Kieber, the first question I'd like to ask is about how um, the medical cannabis certification process in Connecticut has been impacted by the pandemic. And my area of expertise is in the Massachusetts regulations. And here we've seen an expansion of an accommodation to facilitate uh, remote telehealth certification. Can you tell us a little bit about what's been going on in Connecticut? Yes, um, it's very similar in Connecticut as well. Um, we've had to pivot, you know, to both uh, provide access and um, to safe access to patients to come in and, and be uh, recertified or um, receive their initial certification. And the state very early on um, came out and deemed can medical cannabis um, a medical necessity and and so they made it so that we were able to continue to see patients um at first it was an interesting little time because we had to um update our system we always had well we had like a telehealth ability um but never had utilized it because it wasn't permitted in connecticut and so, you know, we had to get everyone trained and get, teach, get everyone access, but we also had to make sure that we provided some on-site support, which required us to, again, you know, change the way in which we were doing things. We began pre-COVID screening for patients um, to not only make uh, our, our staff uh, safe, but to also make our patients uh, feel safe and feel healthy and, and make sure that they, they feel protected. Um, and so it has been interesting in that like now we can pretty much do um, an entire certification and recertification 100% uh, remote uh, via telehealth. And so helping people who weren't that necessarily that um, computer savvy or able to normally maneuver those, um, those channels has been um, interesting, but it has worked. Um, people have appreciated the ability to still access their medication. And we're finding that it's been more important than ever <laughs> now because people are suffering from multiple chronic diseases, mental health issues, including, you know, um, PTSD and trauma that has been um, compounded by COVID-19. And so in Connecticut, the process ultimately has the only change is the addition of the telehealth option. And um, I will say that patients have had some issues with contacting our medical marijuana program when they've had issues because there's limited staffing. So that has been a challenge, but we've tried to work with patients to make sure that they have not had any gaps in um, their access, any gaps in their certification. Um, they also, one thing Connecticut also did was they extended um, the renewal time. So if someone was about to expire, they, uh, I believe, received about 90 additional days. So it made it so it wasn't that much of um, a, a hardship for people in the midst of the pandemic. And, that, and that's still going on today. Um, but it, it, and we have adjusted as well by offering more discounts. Like it's, it's been already embedded in my model to always provide um, a very deep discount to veterans, to people on public and government assistance. And I expanded that to include um, essential workers because essential healthcare workers have been coming um, 
in large numbers being overwhelmed by the responsibilities and the tragedies that they're seeing on a daily basis. So, you know, we really tried to help accommodate patients and make sure it's affordable. Um, and, and if someone really, um, like a lot of my research who couldn't afford it because they were unemployed, we worked with them to make sure that they got their cards regardless. Wonderful. Um, really is such an important part of the process, um, not only facilitating access to medical cannabis for patients, but facilitating access to the card in a way that is safe and keeps providers safe. Um, Kathleen, I know that um, what we just heard about in terms of the Connecticut rules is probably going to be similar to the Massachusetts experience. Um, so I, I'll ask you a little bit about that. And then also, um, they, uh, the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission just updated its regulations related to certification. And one of the interesting elements is going forward, patients can now do telehealth appointments once the um, uh, public health emergency ends for everything except their initial appointment. And patients on SSDI can go two years between appointments. Uh, what do you think of those changes? And do you think that the commission adapted to the lessons learned during the pandemic to make those changes? Uh, yes, I will say Kiba and I run uh, parallel businesses. Um, we have experienced the same um, types of increases with patients coming in, um, money shortages, especially at the beginning. Uh, back in February, before they started shutting things down, we had implemented a screening uh, paper. So anybody that was coming into the offices at that point would have to fill out something asking if they had any, you know, uh, fever, cough, anything like that. Uh, so we started that early on. And then when, when we did close down back in March, um, we were able to pivot and start doing everything online. And it, it really was, uh, we were very, very lucky to have a seamless operation, one day of training with the staff, and we were able to move all of the operations online. Uh, it was, it was the, the patients were immensely thankful uh, because a lot of them were very frightened and they didn't know. Um, so, so that is very parallel to what, to what uh, you know, Kibra had stated. In terms of Massachusetts changing the medical um, condition, uh, the, the medical regulations here in Massachusetts, the um, Cannabis Control Commission, um, you know, unfortunately, I really wished they would have allowed telemedicine for that initial visit yeah. uh, because they do it for everything else. So really isn't a big difference because it's always been the initial visit has to be in person and then anything from there it, even though it wasn't written in the regulations you could have done a telemedicine visit so really we really wanted to see that initial visit being through telemedicine but in times of the pandemic as of now they are allowing the initial visits to be through telemedicine so we're thankful for that it's keeping the patients safe um, and not only that, it's allowed people um, through a greater population to access medical cards. So patients that were homebound, patients that were disabled, patients that were in remote areas of the state who weren't close to any certification centers or weren't close to their doctor, or it was you know, a challenge to get transportation to and from the appointments. This was really a big help. Um, and so, we're really thankful to the Campus Control Commission, but we still have a lot of work to do to allow those initial visits through telehealth as well. And, and as a disabled and homebound medical patient, um, I've had my card going back to 2014, but I let it lapse twice. Uh, because I could not facilitate access uh, to an in-person appointment. Um, and then, um, of course, the Cannabis Control Commission, as you said, did take some of that feedback into consideration, but it was Commissioner Jennifer Flanagan who uh, rose uh, and said that uh, she felt it important uh, for patients to have that first visit in person, and perhaps that's a discussion, as you mentioned, that'll have to continue going forward. Um, one issue I did want to um, touch on as well, and I think it's related, um, which is 
So there's access to the medical card, which uh, you two specialize in, and I want to keep that at the center. But there's also then the access to the medical cannabis. And as some of the studies that Dr. Vidot and Dr. McNam just showed us, one of the biggest impediments to especially patients in vulnerable populations accessing cannabis is the cost. Now, I'm going to start with Massachusetts, but Kibra, um, I'll come to you and we, we can talk about Connecticut as well. Um, Massachusetts has taken a revolutionary step in the past month to expand access to local cost cannabis for patients through its caregiver program, which is a little different than other states in that basically in Massachusetts, a caregiver can be designated on behalf of a patient to grow medical cannabis, and then they can bring that medical cannabis to the patient and charge that patient only for what it costs to grow the plant not the time the caregiver puts into it, just the expenses to grow the plant and transport it. Now, in Massachusetts for the past six years, dating back to 2012, those caregivers could only grow medical cannabis for one patient. They can now grow medical cannabis for five patients. And on top of that, medical patients' home grow rights were expanded. Medical patients can now grow 12 flowering plants, 12 immature plants and have unlimited clones without a hardship license. And if they get a hardship license, they can grow as many plants and have as much cannabis as their doctor or nurse feels is necessary. So can you talk a little bit about how those expansions and, and that access for uh, patients will increase their ability to get low cost cannabis? So right there, that's going to save thousands of dollars for patients, especially the ones that are on limited income, uh, the ones that don't have the disposable income to go and spend, you know, $50 for an eighth of cannabis at their dispensary or, you know, $300 an ounce. And, and there are a lot of dispensaries out there that do have discounts. And, and that's one of the benefits of being a patient is accessing the discounts at all the dispensaries. But specifically, the caregiver expansion uh, is going to be huge here in Massachusetts. When this whole thing first started, there were no dispensaries. Um, everybody had to grow their own. And having a one-to-one -one caregiver was very much an impediment um, to the program at that time. So this, as I said, will save patients thousands of dollars. It'll be able to have them grow for their specific needs. So whatever their ailment is, maybe they focus on you know the, the cultivars and the types of of um, strains that really work with their conditions. Uh, and then they're able to try different ones now with the increase. Um, so maybe they're growing at home, their caregiver is growing their steady supply, and they wanna try a couple of different strains. They're able to do that now without punishment and at a lower cost, uh, enabling them to have more medicine throughout the year uh, and, also, and also save money. Yeah, it's so true. And um, I'm experiencing it firsthand myself. Um, I use um, full extract cannabis oil um, because I, um, along with my disability in my throat and um, optic nerve and facial nerve have a bowel disorder. And full extract cannabis oil is one of the things that has kept me um, off of prednisone um, tapers for the past six years, despite a serious family history of that disease. Um, and the problem is it's 50 to $100 for a gram of FICO, and I take a gram of FICO every few days. So without that expanded access uh, to a hardship grow license and a caregiver, I would never have been able to maintain my access. Um, Kibra, in Connecticut, I'm sure, um, and you mentioned it earlier, um, access to not only the medical card, but low-cost cannabis is something that a lot of patients have at the front of their mind. Um, how do you see that uh, playing out, especially in the context of the pandemic? So I do believe, so in Connecticut, we're not allowed to grow um, for individual use or, or by way of a caregiver. Um, that, that has not been part of our legislation um, initially and in conversations about adult use that has been something that has been quickly dismissed. Um, but I do believe that over the last few months, um, especially because medical cannabis was deemed, uh, you know, essential and access therefore would be essential, um, the conversations have begun to crop up again. <laughs> 
I guess I used a little bit, but (laughs) the conversations have begun to crop up again about our ability to grow both as individuals and, um, and potentially having a caregiver program to ensure that people have access to this essential medication, um, for, for their, for their lives, um, and, and, and to have quality of life. And so that has been, um, a nice, it's given us something, a, a solid foundation to stand on in that um, fight for patients' rights. Um, because the truth of the matter is, if I, w- if I was able to grow my own medication, I would be saving hundreds of thousands, probably, of dollars every year. And for some people, it's not like I'm a nurse. So I never lost my job. You know, in addition to being a business owner, I, I still work. Um, you know, so I really haven't had any major financial disruptions but the people who have you know it's i can't imagine the hardships that they've been facing so yes like kathleen said we have 19 dispensaries here in the state a lot of them offer discounts and had a lot of promotions and 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 we work together you know to make sure that people have what they need but it's not you know it, it it's it's almost like um, you know, they're telling two different stories, you know, either cannabis is essential and we must provide access so people can have quality of life and, um, and, and access to, to play, uh, plant-based medicine or, you know, or we're saying that it isn't if we're not going to support them and making sure that they can afford it and, and, and afford access to medications. So, so well said. Um, and we did uh, start about 10 minutes late on this panel. So we're going to go for, you know, maybe eight to 10 more minutes. And I, I appreciate those who are, are still with us. Um, one element that uh, is part of the Cannabis Center of Excellence's mission and is, is a topic of conversation in almost every cannabis related discussion is social equity. And the harms caused by the war on drugs that disproportionately impacted, especially black, black and brown communities, simply because political leaders, whether it was Henry Anslinger in the 1930s or Nixon and Ehrlichman and um, others in the 1970s, these individuals looked at nonviolent drug laws as a way to target communities that they saw as a threat to their political power. And... Mm -hmm. That was very much coupled with a for-profit prison industrial industry that arose in a very much um, dark and seedy relationship with those same politicians. That caused uh, well, thank you. That caused a <laughs> syst- that caused a systemic legacy um, for years that um, undermined viable uh, business opportunities in those communities and otherwise. So. All that's to say, the reason why social equity is so much an important part of the current conversation about the legalization of cannabis is if there's not that intentional focus, the industry will end up dominated by people who did not suffer at the hands of the drug war. So that brings me back to my question, which is, um, it's about Massachusetts, but it's about social equity in general, and I'll ask it in, in two parts. First part. So in Massachusetts, dating back to 2012, unfortunately, the medical program did not have a social equity component for ownership of medical licenses. The adult use program started in 2016 does have the social equity program and the economic empowerment program. Now, in Massachusetts, another unique aspect is that all medical companies have to be vertically integrated, which means they must cultivate, manufacture, and retail all under the same license. The discussion in Massachusetts going forward is about deverticalization and breaking up those licenses so companies can enter at a smaller level. Should those licenses only go to social equity companies for a period of uh, three to five years? Um, And what more can be done to encourage ownership of medical companies by those from disproportionately impacted communities? Uh, Kibra, Kathleen, please. Um, Well, do you want to go, Kibra? It does. No, you go ahead. <laughs> so I agree um, with social equity. I think that they should have the opportunity to get a running start. Uh, one of the things that I have seen over the progression of the um, dispensaries when they very first started until now, okay, with the recreational in full swing and, and you know, over 100 dispensaries opened up. When they first opened, um, you know, we had a, I had a very close relationship 
with the dispensaries as they opened because we certified medical patients. They needed, med you know, that's that, you know, they will, medical patients is what they're all about. So um, they were all about the medical at the beginning. Um, you know, they promised to make sure everything was, you know, they were taken care of, educated, they were their top priority. And, and it was like that for, for a little bit um, until the recreational started happening. And even at that time, you know, a lot of them pledged, well, we're still going to take care of our medical patients. And then over time, especially with these big multi-state operators and these big franchises, or not franchises, but corporations, um, we saw that that wasn't the case, that the patients were the ones being put on the back burner as the recreational users and purchasers were the ones that were, you know, going through with no problem while the, you know, the medical had to wait because they're only designating one or two staff members from the dispensary to help the, the medical patients. So we saw a big shift in that. So I am very much in, um, in support of the economic and equity uh, community because I believe they're more grassroots, they're more grounded towards the population, they're more focused on the consumer, whether it be medical or recreational, um, especially with the medical. I think allowing them to just have a medical without the onus of being vertically integrated, having to set up a whole grow, staffing it, regulating, you know, all of that. We're going to see a lot more focus in, uh, on the medical community. And I think that would be a good thing. So I am in support of that. And I think Massachusetts really needs to do that. Kibra, I want to come to you, but I want to just thank Kathleen there because as sad as this is to say, a, a certain person or group who shall remain nameless told me that they opposed an equity only period for medical licenses because, quote, those equity companies wouldn't be able to serve medical patients as effectively. And that offended me. I'm not oh. naming you today in, on this forum, but just know I remembered that group that said that. Um, but Kibra, please, your, your thoughts on how we can engender um, social equity in the medical marijuana space, um, I'm, I'm very interested. Sure. Um, and, and we have a similar story in Connecticut. We've started off as medical and there were no equity provisions. Uh, the, the growers are all rich white men <laughs> um, in Connecticut. And, and that's how our dispensary uh, system is as well. Uh, there are there is one Indian um, owner. He, he's from India. Um, but other than that, these are all not people who are not of color. And I do believe that, see, what people don't understand about equity is that equity is not a handout. We're, there is no one that is looking for a handout. What we're looking to do is level the playing field that was unleveled by those racist um, uh, focused arrest and incarceration and you know the war that was was um, put on a community that that's why we're in this position and so because we're acknowledging that this was wrong <laughs> you know any racially motivated legislation should be torn down and and now we have to make that right and so in order to make that right we have to create and provide opportunity now because this, cannabis isn't the only way in which we have disenfranchised communities and we have, you know, there, there requires a lot of education. And so, yes, I am all for, um, I like that. I never really heard that term before, but deverticalization of, you know, of these systems, but, all, and breaking it down into micro licenses that should be offered and afforded to equity applicants first and foremost. However, as we do that, considering the years of disenfranchisement, the years of, of racism and systemic racism specifically, there needs to also accompany those licenses with funds to be able to afford to, to endeavor um, into the, in this industry. Um, there needs to be education there are some basic things that because of the way in which black and brown and poor people have had to live in America, all we've had time to do is survive. We haven't had time to figure out how to start a business or how to properly, you know, so some of those basic tools that 
that anyone would need to succeed in business need to be provided and afforded to those communities. And it also needs to be made very clear that that you don't have to if you come from one of these over police communities or if you suffered at the hands of a racially motivated legislation, you should not only not have to engage in this industry to benefit from it, but your community specifically should benefit from it. So we're not just talking about a dispensary or we're not just talking about um, a grow facility. We're talking about an education system, community gardens, where we're teaching children about all plants and to help them understand the, the, the medicine that is cannabis from a young age so that they respect it and grow up and don't abuse it. You know, so there are many things that we can do in order to make this a fully equitable um, industry. And, and it's due to us, you know, it's due to these communities. And, and so I, I really think it's important that equity is not an afterthought. So like we take Jersey, who just legalized, they have nothing <laughs> about equity. And so now they have to go back and they have to, you know, try to ch drum up some, some support for doing what was right that should have been done before, you know, the legislation was even presented. Um, and so here in Connecticut, we're looking at the potential of um, legalizing for adult use here. And I'm on the governor's um, equity committee. And we're talk we're having these conversations because there is no way in heck that I'm going to allow legalization to happen without making sure that the community's most harmed benefit. Beautiful, beautiful words and, and a very, very poignant uh, point to end on. And if you, uh, Kibra and uh, Chanel Lindsay and Shaleen Title have not been in the same room or virtual room together oh. yet, that we'll, we'll make sure that keeps happening. So. No, those are beautiful. That's the most beautiful room for me to be in. So much knowledge and information. And I really want to thank, you know, I don't know, the Massachusetts leaders in this industry for really giving us a, a, a pathway, you know, to really, to really um, taking the lead and showing us the way in other states that we can say, listen, this is what happened in mass. This is what they were thinking. And this is how it can work here in Connecticut. Or these are ways that we can avoid those things. And we couldn't have done it if you all didn't uh, blaze that trail. So we appreciate you. Thank you for those powerful words. And um, a note on that before I turn it over to Dr. McNabb, uh, Massachusetts last week also decided that all of their new adult use delivery licenses, of which there are two kinds of licenses now, will be going to economic empowerment and social equity applicants for a minimum of three years. Um, so a lot of progress all around. Uh, you who are both some of the most inspiring um, healthcare professionals that I've been able to interview. I'm very grateful to have had the chance to do so. A huge thank you to Dr. McNabb and the Cannabis Center of Excellence. Yeah, and uh, we have one more panel to go, so I will turn it back to Dr. McNabb now. And, and thank you again to Kathleen and Kibra. I hope to talk to you again very soon. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you great. so much. Thank you, Kathleen and Kibra. That was amazing. Um, and a grant. Um, really, I, I, I love working with you all. I've known you all for years and I appreciate you and appreciate all the hard work that you do. So thank I you. Love you too. Love you so much. Um, thank you. Um, right back thanks. thanks. All right. Um, and thank you to everybody for being a part of this event, all the panelists and all the attendees. We are shifting gears to our final panel now. Um, this one is kind of intended, so we started the day off thinking about and uh, learning about preclinical research um, and understanding where in animal models, uh, cannabis and COVID-19 uh, research is happening. Then we looked at the epidemiological level, right? So then we tried to understand what are people reporting um, about COVID-19 and how is it impacting their medical conditions, their use consumption patterns. I know we've just had a really excellent discussion around uh, patient access now in the reality on the ground, um, what's happening uh, with medical cannabis patients um, and how do we increase access. Um, and so now excited to turn to the final panel uh, with two colleagues. Uh, the first is um, uh, Dr. Uh, I mean, uh, sorry, the, the, excuse me, trying to share my screen at the same time and multitask. Uh, give me one second. Um, so the first of our speakers um, is Michael Kahn. Uh, he is the president of MCR Labs. Uh, he'll be talking about um, the impact of uh, COVID-19 and uh, public health in the industry. Hi, Michael. It's great to see you again. Hi, nice to see you. 
Yeah. Um, and then following Michael, we'll have a, uh, a brief chat from uh, Jason Nelson, uh, Senior Vice President of Presco Labs, on some very interesting literature review around cannabis and COVID. So, um, and then we'll end it up with a discussion with all three of us. So, um, just as an introduction to Michael Kahn, he is the president of MCR Labs and also a good friend for many years and colleague. Appreciate all the support over the years, uh, work together. Michael oversees the strategic and planning and execution for all facets of MCR Labs, which is the first cannabis laboratory uh, in Massachusetts in terms of the scientific and business operations. Uh, he has a chemistry background and experience in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, which equipped him with the knowledge to establish MCR as a leader in cannabis testing. Um, as the industry has grown in the Northeast, Michael has become an advocate for patient rates and product safety, um, which has helped solidify MCR Labs as one of the most trusted names in the New England cannabis community, and I would agree. Um, we've worked together on several different projects, and um, you know, including the vape ban. Um, so I'm really interested to uh, hear what you have to say, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share if you want to start yours. Thank you again for being a part of this. Oh, I think you're uh, maybe on mute. Cool, we can see your screen, but... Can you see my screen? We can. We can yes. And can you see the presentation? We can. Yeah. It's looking like a, pre a presenter's view, though, so we can see first slide and next slide. Oh, my. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure how to fix that from here. Uh, maybe display settings. Click that one. And there we go. Uh, thanks. Is that good? Yep, yes. perfect. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, thanks for having me. This is... Uh, so great and so important. I'm just I'm just really thrilled to, to be a part of this. So thank you very much. Um, I, I'm sorry about this. Let's see. There. Okay. First, a brief introduction. Um, I, I, I am with MCR Labs. We are a team of scientists, uh, chemists, researchers, uh, and cannabis uh, enthusiasts who are passionate about cannabis science and uh, research. Um, from day one, we've been dedicated to supporting the community um, uh, through encouraging safe and responsible cannabis consumption and destigmatizing uh, the use of cannabis. Our mission is really focused on public health. Um, that's where we make all of our business decisions, all of our ethical decisions. It's all about public health and making sure that the community is, uh, is safe. So, when COVID came around, it, 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 was, it was very difficult from a business perspective, from, from an operational perspective, but I, I feel that, that given our team, we, we were able to do the best that we could with a really scary situation. And I, I wanna take this time to just really go into a little bit of the details of what we've done in, in, the, in the hopes that somebody here could take even one policy that we've created or, or something away and, and, and have it prevent somebody else from getting sick. Um, I, I understand that we're talking about how this affects the cannabis industry, but if we are not, uh, if we don't keep, take care of our employees and ourselves, then we can't help to continue to keep cannabis patients and users throughout the state safer. So looking internally, we've, you know, we, we scrambled we made sure that we put our employees health first and to do that um the first thing that we really did was we we appointed people we took our entire r d team and, and we asked them to stop all of their current projects and really focus on COVID and safety and keep up with um cdc and dph guidelines on what are the best practices um we've all learned a lot over the past year or so about COVID and, and how it's transmitted and what are the best practices for um, for mitigating the risks associated with COVID. And um, because we've learned a lot, that means that our policies internally need to change with, with what we learn. So some of the biggest changes that we made operationally were, um, one, we, we separated all of our lab shifts. Uh, we wound up actually having a cadence of some days on and some days off for everybody to make sure that we have much smaller groups ever really interacting. 
with each other. Um, we changed to appointment only sample submissions to keep both our, our employees and the, you know, anybody submitting samples um, safer. We have health evaluations for all of our employees, um, including te temperature checks and so on. Um, we have lab disinfection procedures. We actually do local swabbing of uh, faucets and doorknobs and, and stuff like that that we then send out for testing for COVID to get a, um, a general view of, of whether there is a problem somewhere in the building, in which case we can devote more resources to figuring out exactly where. We actually also started doing mask testing. Um, so uh, our employees are you know, wearing masks and they get to submit their mask and, and we um, send those out for COVID testing just to, you know, the, the more data we have, the more information we have, we, the, the safer we can keep all of our employees. Um, another policy that we've instituted is if, if you can work from home, you should work from home. So only if you have to be on site, can you be on site? Um, we want everybody to take paid sick time. If you're sick, just please don't come in. We'll, we'll pay you. We have an institute that has your pay. We um, offer PPE to all of our employees, and we actually provide weekly COVID reports from our uh, science team about the state of um, COVID in the state and uh, what to do about it. Okay, I know there's a lot in there, but we can get to more after. Um, so general big picture, the lessons that we've learned from, from COVID, right? We, the, the most important step was that we appointed qualified people and we created a, a COVID committee uh, to oversee all of our operational responses. This is where we take the CDC or the DPH guidelines and we um, translate them to what it looks like operationally within the lab. We constantly monitor best practices um, and recommendations and we apply them to, to every internal operation. And we also communicate our operational capabilities to our clients so that they can make informed decisions if we have a backlog because of COVID, if we have uh, uh, maybe somebody gets sick and, and we, we need to shut the operations down, we have to communicate all of that really well to all of our clients. Um, uh, so from a public health and testing standpoint, you know, we've developed policies that apply expert recommendations to each operation uh, we provide their needed resources, including PPE and time off as needed, right? We do extensive contact tracing. For example, we, keep, we ask our employees to keep a log of who they talk to closely at any given day at the end of the day, you write, it, write it down. And then that's, you know, if, if there's ever a problem, we can quickly contact trace and, and ask the people that could have possibly been affected to uh, not come in until they been properly tested and cleared. And the last and probably the most important is to be always be prepared with contingency plans. Do the mind this, the, the uh, just, just a mental experiment. What if one person on this shift turns out to have been positive? What are we gonna do? What are the next two, three, four, five steps that we take to make sure that our operation continues to function that we provide the, the, um, the necessary level of testing for the industry to keep the industry going. That's, that's all I have in a formal way. So I'm here to take any questions too. Awesome, thank you, Michael. I really appreciate that. You, uh, it's very clear that MCR Labs has implemented a gold standard of um, prevention and policies. And I, I wanted to hear from you in this topic because I think because you have taken such care um, as an employee health and, and work environment, even to the point of having your doorknobs and your masks test, um, I think that that's really critical. And I, I, I feel like those, those high level policies um, really could help people uh, when they're in now ha having to do live in this new situation of employment to prevent transition, uh, transmission. Um, so I wonder if you had, if you, you know, and back when the epidemic uh, started, obviously adult use was deemed non-essential. 
um, but medical industry was. And what, what major changes, have you seen changes in production or major changes in even testing profiles or anything since COVID started? Some of well, your answers. Good question, to be honest with you, it, it's been a little turbulent, at least at first when, um, uh, when, when the recreational sites were all shut down, uh, we had much fewer samples coming in because we weren't allowed to receive those samples. It was very odd. They, they, they shouldn't necessarily be connected. They, the girls are, you know, in large warehouses. They don't require a whole ton of people to be all on top of each other inside of there. Um, it, it did create a, a, a bit of a, a bottleneck where at first we received no samples and then when they were allowed to, to come to, to resume operations, all of a sudden we were swamped with samples that were created over the period of time that was that everything was closed. And um, yeah, operationally COVID has not been easy. Yeah. Honestly, it's, um, it's harder to hire people. It's harder to, to first stop operations largely. And then all of a sudden resume operations at four or five fold the volume that we used to. It's, um, um, uh, I mean, we work through it, but it's, uh, yeah. 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 For us, it's been kind of hard. Yeah, and it's, so you can also see, I mean, for the dispensaries also, <clears throat> in which then trickles down to patient access. Yeah. Uh, it's hard, um, you know, and COVID is, is putting the pinch on everything. Um, so now I'm uh, gonna, gonna really very excited to introduce our, our last speaker. Please hang around, Michael, as well. Um, and we'll have a discussion after Jason presents together. Um, so now excited to introduce Jason Nelson, who's the Senior Vice President of Horticulture um, at Cresco Labs. Um, Jason is going to be presenting a very, very exciting um, uh, review of literature around the COVID-19 pandemic and, and cannabis, but from a multi-state operator cannabis uh, perspective. Um, Jason is a, as I mentioned, the, um, serves as the Senior Vice President uh, of Horticulture at Cresco and has over eight years of experience in the modern regulated cannabis industry. Um, as a an agronomy and horticulture degree from Kansas State University. Um, Jason joined the cannabis industry uh, in 2002 um, and returned to academia right after that to get a master's degree in horticulture uh, with the intent um, of entering the cannabis industry, uh, regulated cannabis industry. Uh, Jason has joined Cresco Labs in 2016 and is tasked with overseeing all cultivation and lab extraction operations as the Senior Vice President uh, with direct responsibility over the bulk of revenue generating operations. Um, so I'm very excited, Jason, to have you and I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you guys. And can you hear me and see my screen? Uh, we can hear you, but we can't see your video. So if you wanna, no, of course, I'm struggling. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm gonna block the video just on the chance that my kids' uh, learning zooms are gonna mess with my bandwidth. So hopefully, my bandwidth cooperates. And if you can see my presentation screen, so. perfect. Yes, we can see your presentation. Can you guys hear and see me? Okay. Absolutely. Great. Okay. I'll wait. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. McNabb. And so um, I'm, uh, I've, I can't thank everybody enough for the opportunity to be able to speak with you today. Um, I'm going to yammer on. Hopefully my, and my connection isn't too implicated. But um, first and foremost, thank you to the other panelists and uh, to lament with what Michael was going through there. Obviously, um, from an operational perspective, from an MSO perspective, COVID-19 has been very challenging. I credit to all of our leadership, uh, obviously from the executive level, director level, all the way down to our facility leadership um, and, and frontline worker resources being able to pivot and maintain success successful operations during this COVID pandemic. And so thank you all significantly uh, from me personally uh, to all of my other Crestfield Labs contemporaries. Um, I am, a, as Dr. McNabb mentioned, uh, speaking to you today as a Senior Vice President of Horticulture, working primarily under our Public Affairs Department, um, executing our uh, seed initiatives and supporting those initiatives and our, our education initiatives. And you know, thank you to, uh, to Ms. Smith Bolden and Ms. McKinnon and, and likewise Grant for facilitating that excellent discussion on uh, equity. As obviously, uh, you know, business ownership and that the component of cannabis certainly needs a lot of work and investment, and then not to, to either shortchange the, the equitable access to cannabis um, and what kind of role um, the industry maturation plays in making sure that we are doing this responsibly. 
And so that, that's my hope today, essentially, is to talk a little bit about uh, our multi-state operator perspective and realities. And as Dr. McNabb mentioned, we're fortunate to be in position to have invested in a, a significant literature review on cannabis, its constituents, and the implication on um, COVID-19 specifically. And, and again, credit to the previous presenters. And, and my thank, I'm thankful that the slides I've put together in some ways serve as a bit of a review and, and a reinforcement of some of the, the key concepts that they put in place. So again, as a, a licensed MSO reality, again, thank you, Dr. McNabb, for the introduction there. I'm fortunate to have um, some scientific training and background in addition to that 20 plus uh, years of regulated cannabis, starting way back in California, some time in Denver, and now obviously uh, the last years with Cresco as a multi-state operator. And to comment on Cresco, essentially, obviously, um, you know, we understand essentially what um, a successful consumer packaged goods company is going to look like. That's That's been our goal. That's, that's a lot of our um, initiatives when it comes to standardizing, normalizing, professionalizing this industry from a consumer packaged good lens um, as a licensed operator, uh, our current MSO footprint across nine states, 15 production facilities, um, and 29 retail licenses, which are under the uh, um, being executed currently. Um, we were, Cresco Labs was born uh, out of the Illinois medical market. Obviously, our, our next uh, states of entry were Pennsylvania and Ohio, uh, and these can be considered hyper-regulated markets. And, and we've had some challenges, obviously, associated with that, but then also some benefits when it comes to us being uh, a leading stakeholder, and when it comes to patient safety, when it comes to a doctor-patient relationship being respected by a consumer packaged goods company. Certainly a much different experience than I had in Denver or California before that. Um, the question, and, and hey, I really appreciate everybody's comments on the nature of an MSO. Um, and, and I think for us, what we ask ourselves at Cresco Labs all the time is, uh, you know, what is an ethical role, one, in cannabis research and industry advancement uh, for an MSO? Um, what, what should we spend our time focused on and investing in? How should we approach this last, hopefully this last stage of cannabis normalization within society? And my first comment there, I think is true that most people understand that um, MSO expansion or any expansion into a new license market um, from any stakeholder, it's highly capital and resource intensive, intensive, no matter what kind of facility you're bringing into the space, whether it's production, retail, um, corporate uh, footprints, staffing those. I mean, credit to our HR department who's gone through an insane expansion uh, over the last year and a half to two years. Um, that's an ex extremely occupying circumstance that uh, all of our, our, certainly our executives, our mid-level leadership, even some of our facility folks, it's a, a constant 50 to 60 hour week work week to navigate this uh, nascent industry expansion. Um, and, and really alongside us, many of the other operators have successfully navigated that, but certainly challenging. Um, and we do, we have to acknowledge and address both the MSO reputation, uh, the stigma associated with that, which some of you have begun to uh, elucidate during our previous comments and some chat, um, and likewise a conflict of interest. So that, uh, you know, ultimately if I wanted to uh, become say a Monsanto and, and put a lot of money into internal research, ultimately patenting the results, um, that conflict of interest is something that certainly I think is more um, significant when it comes to cannabis. Um, you know, that could certainly take some stigma from a medical community saying, well, you're just going to say that cannabis uh, fixes everything. <laughs> cannabis is, is a cure-all for every uh, particular ailment. So, of course, you have a financial interest in, in building confidence in cannabis as a therapeutic. Um, so we, we want to work to navigate and avoid those conflict of interests, and that puts us in a position to essentially opt to invest in education, to uh, minority business empowerment, towards uh, community college investment, to help empower the next stage of normalization within this industry, and foster those forthcoming relationships uh, for cannabis research. Um, and, and one of the key things we talk about is you know, how limited uh, cannabis research is in the, uh, the United States, certainly. Other countries are starting to take a lead ahead of us. Um, and so it's, it's our goal and mission to essentially foster that that type of relationship. Discussions for today, as I mentioned, uh, we'll do a quick look at some key publications driving next steps. Um, and, and again, I'm excited that we're going to be putting uh, a publication out shortly that is a, a very nice literature review of what applicable uh, research has been completed, uh, certainly uh, less frequently in, in uh, human trials, but um, with respect to cannabis and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And I will I'll spend a few breaths talking about, um, you know, what we need to be doing as MSOs, not only myself, but likewise partners in the space to, to make sure we're advancing this initiative. Do you have to make this disclaimer? I'm obviously very fortunate to have a robust and, and professional legal team at Cresco Labs. Its current and former directors, officers, employees, shareholders, owners, and or attorneys are making no claim that cannabis products can treat or cure COVID-19 infection. And I think from even that statement, you guys certainly understand that the scrutiny that an MSO should uh, be able to offer operate under from not only a public perspective, a federal perspective, um, and that ultimately we're, we're setting the stage we hope to uh, support forthcoming research without any kind of operator bias associated with it. 
So let's, let's just do a quick research amalgam, essentially. Um, currently hundreds of publications, soon to be thousands of publications, pretty specifically tailored to cannabis um, and various uh, illnesses, health maladies, let's call it. Um, if you start to lump in social studies of economic impact, um, those types of things uh, into that, that uh, statement, it's obviously above uh, thousands of, of research publications, and those are certainly well represented amongst the stakeholders today. But with respect to something like COVID-19, obviously there's an opportunity to le leverage existing uh, applicable findings to, uh, from cannabis research to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, you know, first and foremost, I, I had this listed before I realized Dr. Kovalchuk was uh, able to share with us today. So thank you for him for breaking down in detail what uh, this, uh, and I'll change that from a preprint now to a publication. Dr. Kovalchuk, congratulations on that. Um, you know, what this could serve as a foundation for next steps in cannabinoid studies um, with the specific iteration of COVID-19. Um, and uh, there has been other cannabinoid research associated with SARS-CoV-2, uh, you know, viral activity and or symptoms. Um, they mentioned the cytokine storm uh, mitigation. Obviously, I think most people are aware that that's one of the most deleterious outcomes of a COVID-19 infection. And so the potential of THC to help mitigate uh, some of that negative side effect. Likewise, Dr. Mohan uh, excellently represented um, some of the research that, that he's worked with and, and cited, um, you know, tissue, tissue inflammation and viral replication um, being mitigated and or reduced with the introduction of cannabinoids. And so um, escalate those. I've also included some other citations um, alongside uh, these recommendations as just leading work in the space and, and credit to Dr. McNabb and the CCOE for bringing these leading stakeholders into this panel. With respect to cannabinoids, comorbidities, and drug side effect, uh, side effect mitigation, again some citations there of interest, um, and, and thank you, uh, the previous Dr. Beal, for um, going into some of the uh, details about the ECS. I know that she and I both could spend a couple of hours talking about uh, the endocannabinoid system, the modulation, um, and potential improvement to those comorbidities that, that proved to be so lethal or can be lethal with COVID-19 infection. And, and she did such a good job. I can just put on my uh, fun fact hat and say that, well, actually, the endocannabinoid system was discovered because of cannabis research. Um, and so it's, you're right, uh, a lot of medical professionals did not have that um, topic covered during their, their training and their education. And so very exciting time for what the endocannabinoid system might be doing for us. Um, same with remdesivir. So obviously an effective uh, medicinal treatment upon hospitalization. Um, there can be persistent lung damage associated with remdesivir use. And there is a CBD study. Um, and as I mentioned, everything that I've talked about up until this point, uh, to back to my original joke, is not a human clinical trial. Um, we haven't gotten there yet. And we're going to talk about next steps, hopefully, how we can get ourselves to that space. Um, so, you know, in general, uh, not to neglect, I certainly, Dr. Kovalchuk mentioned uh, the potential benefit of the entourage effect. There is research out there that uh, specific terpenes essentially do have benefits against some of the implications of COVID-19. I've listed some of them here, um, whether it is uh, direct antiviral properties, whether it's an implication on a comorbidity, uh, or some of the just general side effects, the uncomfortable side effects of a typical COVID-19 infection. Um, there's evidence out there that terpenes can have impact against that. And the the, the hope with this published research amalgam is merely setting the stage for what the next steps in legitimized research can look like. And so let's talk about what in our mind is a feasible outcome from a public partnership potential, that the private partnership potential. I think everybody understands our nature as an MSO. Um, we had to essentially build our operations, uh, you know, in the absence of public research about what are the most effective ways to consume cannabis. Um, and as part of that relationship with the cannabis community, um, being born in Illinois, certainly Pennsylvania, it's a very direct relationship between not only a patient and a consumer, that patient and consumer is typically more involved with a doctor um, and, and in counsel with a doctor. And so it, while it's effective information, it's generally anecdotal. And so that, that's been our nature of our existence for the last few years, and it certainly gives us the hunger for um, what we'll call legitimized cannabis research. We have experience with multiple product delivery mechanisms. We've, if it's out there, we've tried to make an iteration of it. Uh, likewise, with multiple cannabinoid and terpene ratio applications, I think um, you know we're we're in a fortunate licensed position to be able to work with THC, at least in a a, um, a commodity type circumstance. And so ultimately, we have experience in understanding you know what a, a one to one a CBD to THC ratio uh, product iteration might look like. Same with understanding limits on like terpene uh, applications. That terpenes are effective. Um, we've had problems with products that are over five to seven percent to total terpene by volume. Um, it makes everybody sneeze. And so even that type of information can hopefully expedite someone who is interested to execute a clinical trial in cannabis and, and refine their initial efforts. And that really, I think, is where our responsibility lies. Um, it needs to be in an advisory and a manufacturing role. 
Um, so much so that when we are willing to align medical research institution within siloed state markets uh, prior to deschedule and rescheduling, um, they're going to serve as our watchdogs, essentially. They're going to develop this research cadence, essentially uh, cooperatively develop the cocktail. And I appreciate Dr. Kavlachuk's comments on a single com compound versus a cocktail, uh, perhaps pursuing that entourage effect. Um, and, and that's a, a tough debate. You know, it's, it, it can be difficult to understand what uh, specific components are doing, let alone what kind of interplay there might be when you have more than one constituent uh, in, a, in a study. Um, we would need to align on a dosage mechanism, inhale versus injected, appreciate that data on the, the increase in edible consumption. And it'd be nice to know that, yes, a consumed edible is as effective as an inhaled mist when it comes to an implication on a virus. Um, we, we're in position essentially to manufacture the treatment in placebo, uh, you know, that we're in, we're essentially a manufacturing operation that could uh, you know, make an activated product or a product, uh, assign that a, a like uh, placebo and, and distribute that out to a medical research institution. They would complete the trial and they would validate the results. They have to. They have to serve as our watchdog uh, to be, uh, you know, have any kind of relevance in the space and, and forego that obvious conflict of interest that uh, certainly MSOs have. Um, and then it is, those initial findings within uh, future next generation research initiatives. Um, and really the quick nod to the avenues of allowance, um, you know, essentially the Moore Act, uh, nice symbolic vote in the House last week. It uh, looks like HR 3797, the uh, Medical Marijuana Research Act, is up for vote in the House this week. I think everybody on the, the call certainly realizes the challenge that would come in the Senate. Um, even if we have a more sympathetic Senate uh, arrive in 2021, uh, you know, these legislative actions are, are certainly uh, not a, a quick game by any means, but there are mechanisms out there. The current DA registration under uh, current federal law, is it's certainly a challenging process. There's, what, 37 applications out now that have not been approved for four years um, with, with now lawsuits filed against the, the DEA for slow playing those. Um, it's just drastically limited. Um, so, you know, while, while folks should push those uh, avenues as much as they're able to, um, a, a, even as Dr. Dr. Kovalchuk mentioned that even the ability to import um, something uh, for, for a clinical trial is just drastically limited. And so my hope from uh, painting this picture is what we're capable of doing as an MSO, what we need to advocate to change, and what we hope that future advocacy looks like for clinical research in cannabis. So let's wrap it up. Um, you know, the, really, we try to think about things in the nature of cannabis as a whole as a potential therapeutic. Um, we talked about the accessibility and the social adjacency compared to traditional pharmaceutical treatments. Um, there definitely needs to be a discussion of uh, price and accessibility um, for all populations who have access to cannabis. And it's true that whether it's a legitimate market or a black market, that it's uh, a very ubiquitous component of society. And obviously nothing would please all of us more that research can continue to fuel um, the abatement of black market activity or illicit market activity, um, and then transitioning into a more formalized marketplace that's safer for patient consumptions. Um, you know, we could need an ongoing treatment option for these uh, patients who uh, look to be suffering from this long haul experience, that if there's a potential of cannabis to help address some of those symptoms that a um, subset of the uh, infected population seems to experience, that uh, it'd be great to be able to research that and understand any potential benefit they may gain. Um, sounds like that this particular um, vaccine is a low risk of viral mutation, uh, you know, rendering the, the vaccine itself a little less effective, but um, that uh, even if this isn't our last uh, respiratory um, pandemic, uh, as, as a lot of public officials have warned uh, for years, you know, it would be certainly useful to understand what the validity of cannabis is as a hedge against either this individual virus mutation or the next iteration of a respiratory illness that, that could drastically affect society as COVID-19 has. Um, I will say that, you know, pharmaceutically based manufacturing techniques, those are well established in the industry, especially us um, second generation medical markets. You know, I, I understand what it takes to manufacture a 10 milligram gel capsule filled with a placebo that looks identical. So that, you know, all of the things that it would take to be able to execute these uh, types of trials. And then two, to be able to say, okay, Dr. Kalachuk, um, if you have all these cultivars uh, that some look to be effective, some look to be not, if I'm actually going to step away from a cultivar approach and just approach it from a biosynthetic uh, perspective, uh, what ratios of major cannabinoids, what terpenes need to be in the mix that can actually be biochemically synthesized so that I don't have to send a particular strain that's effective across the country. Rather, it's, it is, it's a recipe. Um, it's something that, that we can stand behind as, as showing some potential uh, and let the public obviously reference the research um, under all the traditional guidelines and approvals that we would expect to be subject to. Um, we're, we're very familiar with scalable manufacturing and distribution. Uh, they are relatively immediate prospects. 
Um, a lot of the MSO's um, challenges is that we are beholden to uh, private sector dollars where people are spending their money. Um, and right now, um, for us to be able to build a successful company, uh, medically oriented products, uh, people don't spend the dollars on them that they do recreational products. And um, I hope that we can move away from those types of incentives, but it's just a very difficult role to hoe as a multi-state operator in the absence of traditional banking. Um, and when it comes to us being able to build a successful company that respects the, the needs and wishes of our employees, investors, all of the fiduciary relationships that go into being an MSO. Um, those quality standards are in place, especially these secondary regulated markets. Um, and, and that's at all different types of product iterations. Um, and, and so we can operate in confidence. We, we have these strict medical circumstances that Cresco was born under and um, you know, those are our achievable achievable they're attainable and we want that confidence not only in our products but likewise in giving so certain products to a research institution to be able to execute that research and finally I will say in, in a conclusion that um, you know all of these research academic institutions that were represented today, they're thoroughly capable of successfully executing this diverse, these diverse research initiatives of all the potential, whether it's social implications of cannabis legalization, whether it's um, uh, demographic and economic outcomes, if it is the medical outcomes. Um, we're just really interested in supporting these organizations in a non-biased fashion because we want the truth. Uh, we all want the truth about what cannabis can do and what it can't do. And so we're, we're continually uh, you know, publishing tangible outcomes, re reportable outcomes, and how we're investing in this space, um, and are excited at the prospects for the future, but obviously the federal hurdles in the meantime uh, are certainly significant for any interested research institutions. Um, and so with that, uh, again, sincere thanks, and thanks to all of my panel um, members. It was a very enlightening discussion, and, and likewise to all of my coworkers at Cresco Labs for all the work that you do. And uh, hopefully my uh, connection there wasn't too implicated, Dr. McNabb, but uh, I'm gonna stop the screen share and, and certainly open to a discussion. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, I think that whole presentation sung, um, you know, things that I've been talking about for four years um, and waiting to hear for four years from a multi-state operator. Um, so I, uh, you know, that was an excellent presentation, excellent uh, recommendations for the industry. And I think it really points out how challenging cannabis research is. And you did a nice summary of taking all the way from the start to where we are now. Um, you know, you had, as a multi-state operator, uh, would be willing and ready to commit to work with an academic institution. Some academic institutions I found, oh, okay, we'll take cannabis money uh, and we'll silo it so that it doesn't impact our federal funding for all of our other research studies. But then you'll find universities that don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Um, you know, I actually came from the academic uh, industry and left that industry because of those challenges so that I could study cannabis to bring it back to the industry. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to thank you. And I think, you know, it was very, very interesting. Uh, I think there is real opportunity for... Uh, cannabis research and for COVID to continue. Um, I'm really interested to hear what Michael's thoughts were on, on Jason's presentation as a researcher and um, knowing, you know, we have a research license uh, category in Massachusetts and, you know, could this have any impact? Yeah, th thank you for that enlightening presentation, Jason. That was, that was great. And I, and I, I largely agree with, with all of the sentiments here. We, we do need more data. We need to study this, this extremely complex um, uh, medicinal effort, right? There are too many, there's just so many analytes, right? It's just, it needs a lot of good hard work. And what we need is to be allowed to, to partner with the experts in, 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 the, in the various industries that, that could really help move this forward, right? I mean, our hands are, are pretty tied for a while. You know, it's, it's, we can do some research and it can be very fruitful, but really you're right, we need, we need those partnerships. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I'm not sure how else to say it. Like yeah. that's, that's what we need. It is what we need. Um, yeah. I wonder, Michael or Jason, from your perspective, uh, do you, I feel like this, Cresco is taking a pretty, pretty bold and great stance on this. Do you feel like your other partner MSOs are? Um, in the same sort of direction or line of thought for cannabis research, or are they kind of focused mainly on profits? A great question. Um, you know, we do work to align partnerships amongst MSOs. So, you know, I, I think we, we term them as co-opetition or co you know, <laughs> cooperative competition, uh, because obviously, you know, a part of Cresco's mission is really is to, is to normalize cannabis and, and how that's going to, to move itself forward. So I, I would say that 
Um, I'm confident that Cresco, uh, across all of those equitable initiatives, including these research initiatives, um, between the staff that we have in place, the departments, the investments we make across all of our operating markets, and even into markets that we're not even operating in, um, I'm comfortable with us as a, a leader example. But um, you know, you, you definitely have to give some MSOs credit um, with respect to, to contributing to the spaces and uh, in a way that I think aligns with their goals. But you know, ultimately, I, I think we feel like we need to position ourselves to really be stewards of, of one addressing the issues that. Uh, were evident when Cresco was born, essentially uh, that white equity ownership compete, uh, piece, the, the knowledge barriers when it comes to equitable business participation, not even with respect to, um, say, license applicants, but then uh, secondary ancillary businesses who are operating in these neighborhoods currently. Um, how do we empower them to be able to uh, start serving and satisfying some of the needs of these new operators coming into the space? Um, and outside of that, I think there was a comment in the chat, too, of uh, building a, a home grow um, repository for information of, okay, you want to home grow, obviously have horticultural scientists in space that can um, work through some general information to, to help so hope that somebody wade through all the uh, online grow forums if they were starting to jump into their own space. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's an exciting time to be able to represent those investments. I know for me, I spent four years of, it really was, it was a lot of private equity chasing in the absence of traditional banking for us to be able to build what we've done. And, and now to be able in 2020 to transition from all of those revenue activities I spent the first three years doing uh, now to these initiatives, um, I hope that other MSOs follow that example and, and serve as not only financial investors, but then just really the, the access to this type of information and, and proprietary knowledge I think is very valuable. Yeah, well, I, I agree. And I thank you for, for pivoting in that way. Um, one of the things that we've, I think we've seen is the impact of COVID-19 um, also is disproportionately impacting people of color and neighborhoods and communities um, that have been devastated by the war on drugs um, in different ways um, and in communities that, um, you know, uh, may have a different access to testing um, for COVID-19 or, or healthcare uh, in general. Um, and so I, I think it's important as we move forward in this COVID-19 research from variety perspectives, right? So from the cannabis medicinal side, understanding, you know, the terpenes and the cannabinoid ratios and profiles, but also that how that uh, is um, works within these different populations. Cannabis is a very, what I'm learning, is a very, very personalized medicine um, and ensuring access uh, to medical cannabis is, is imperative. And I, I want to draw right now, I worked uh, in, prior to cannabis in the HIV epidemic. And um, when the HIV epidemic started, there were no drugs, there was not a lot of testing. Um, and I worked in, uh, in resource poor countries where, um, you know, it was much harder to gain access than the United States. And what we saw happen was drugs became developed by pharmaceutical industry. They got you know, uh, price gouging happened, um, and it became very expensive to get a lifelong chronic care treatment for HIV. And what happened then in the world is different advocates came together and said, you know, had to negotiate governments, advocates, presidents with the pharmaceutical industry to make sure that those drug prices could be lowered and healthcare access could be for all. Um, I could see in the COVID-19 epidemic, once you find that panacea, um, you know, a similar type pricing out of the industry. We've seen that a little bit in the cannabis industry already with Epidiolex and FDA approved drugs. So I wonder, you know, this, I mean, you're presenting a very interesting approach, but how, you know, how are we going to tease out access, partnership with academic institutions, conflict of interest, and make sure that we have low enough prices that people can afford them? I know that's a loaded question, <laughs> um, but I think it's a good one that, you know, we should really address in this industry. Yeah, it is a great question. I think there's there's different avenues of what normalization is going to look like. You're certainly talking about it from a clinical medical perspective, which is vital to understand. Even from a commodity perspective, uh, you know, understanding that right now in these siloed markets, you have different uh, relationships between supply and demand, wholesale price. That's that's going to reconcile someday, uh, one way or another. Um, and I think a key thing would obviously be federal leadership. Um, you know, when it comes to trying to put together task force and committees of all these stakeholders to say, okay, look, if you uh, go this route for commodity normalization, these are going to be some unintended consequences. Or if you allow uh, this type of stakeholder to fund uh, medicinal research, this is exactly the type of um, conflict of interest that could be 
I really feel like that uh, as a, a culture, a society, as a, a collection of experts, that a, a federal leadership initiative could, as good as has be hoped for, navigate those types of issues, whether it's exclusion of equitable participation, whether it's uh, certain markets still struggling with, you know, in the absence of even an insurance copay with affordable cannabis medications, um, you know, being able to align those stakeholders, you know, and I hate to sound uh, turned into socialist territory here, but it, it really is such a, a wide array of one stakeholders and implications and outcomes that are going to change in the next five to 10 years. It really, I think from the top down, we need strong federal leadership, uh, one that understands their role as a watchdog and a facilitator for equitable inclusion and normalization of cannabis. And then for us, it's essentially, all right, um, you know, we, we want, if we want to become PepsiCo or Frito-Lay or whatever else some MS those um, uh, claim they want to become, what's a, uh, a reasonable mechanism to allow that to happen while making sure that we're empowering all of these other stakeholders that have previously been um, obscured from the process? So a great question. I, I think it, it really does come from federal leadership. I would, I would agree. Um, Michael, so we just heard um, a lot of presentations today about really different cannabinoids, terpenes, profiles, you know, different compounds having anti-inflammatory, different compounds having different impacts. You guys study these in your lab all the time and you have great educational, um, you know, snippets. So I wanna give a shout out to go to MCR Labs website if you wanna learn about terpenes and all these compounds and what they do and what they're seeing. I'm uh, really impressed with your weekly reports and everything. Um, so what did you think, Michael? I mean, about all these different compounds and, you know, their potentials from what you know. I mean, <sighs> My, it's it's hard for me to comment unless we have just really good clinical data, which is what everybody's waiting for. So I I, I get I get a little nervous in commenting on any anything that specific. Uh, I it, it, before I, before I go on, if if you find yourself on mcrlabs.com, we do have a really cool um, uh, repository of literature where. You, you can search um, through through that website by by your medical condition or by the cannabinoid that you're looking for, um, which just leads you to you know our compilation of peer reviewed articles. So if if you have a specific condition and you you're not sure where to start on mcrlabs.com, that's the cannabis review. It, it it can really help you get started. It's not the final answer because, again, we don't have clinical data, but there at least is some, um, there, there, is, there is something out there, right? There, there are peer-reviewed placebo-controlled studies that, that can lead you to, uh, hopefully, to, to better outcomes, right? Again, I, 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 I'm, I get nervous talking about specifically that like, this is going to work because I, I, <laughs> I do too and we, we yeah because you shouldn't and uh we don't know uh, and we don't know what's happening and what's really sad is that we don't know what's happening because of just regulatory restrictions um, right so the best i could do is to point to peer-reviewed articles yeah. for now and that's the best that is just like I, to me that's the best level of data that we have i would love it if it was stronger but it's not you know, we have some FDA approved, you know, like at the dialects, like there, there are, there is some data there, but it's, again, it's so little, you know, we, we've tried to work with local universities and it's just incredible how hard it is to get through compliance departments at universities yeah. to just get a publication out there. Right. It, it's, it takes years sometimes. Um, uh, we should have a couple coming out in the next few months, but that's just, it's so not enough as far as I'm concerned. We just need a lot more. Um, uh, right now, what, I'm sorry, right, right now what we see in the lab, right? We're not a research institution. We do, you know, testing of, of the products out there. And what we see are, are that just big picture. We've been doing this since 2013. So over the last seven, seven years or so, we've seen an evolution of, of cannabis and cannabinoids and, and terpene profiles found, you know, it's, it's really cool. You, you get, you get to see how people are breeding and evolving cannabis to have more potent, more targeted ratios, um, targeted ratios of terpenes to cannabinoids, uh, the, the variety of products, the roots of administration, the, the just 
it's it's been really cool to watch. I know we could do more, but it's you know, my hats off to all of the producers out there who who are able to to take you know some knowledge of the farm you know good decent knowledge of the pharmaceutical pathways of of, of creating medicine and applying them to this to this industry. It's been it's been a pleasure watching it evolve. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you both so much. I think we, um, we've we gone over a little bit of time, um, but I appreciate you both, both of your presentations and your thoughts and discussions and contributions to the industry. Um, and thank you to everybody who's still hanging on here. Um, we have recorded this, um, and I got one last plug um, to do before we end the event, um, which is, um, you know, one, to thank everybody for, for coming. Um, but we also know that it's, it's difficult, as we've discussed, uh, lack of funding for cannabis research um, and, and cannabis researchers is, is, uh, is woefully underfunded. So one of the approaches we've used is to launch a new store. Oops. Um, so we have a new, a new clothing line that we're um, launching to help us uh, fund some of our cannabis research studies. Um, and participating in this event, uh, we'll give you a 10% off discount using COVID-19. Um, so thank you. It's really fun gear, cannabis research gear. Um, so, uh, and again, thank you for everybody for participating in this event. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, it was incredible amount of information. Um, was, I think very, very informative, um, understanding where we are in the state of the science and how, how COVID-19 is impacting in cannabis. So, um, thank you again so much, and um, we will uh, be posting this video recording um, for viewing later. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, thank you. Th thank you all. Our, our stream has ended. H have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grant. Thank you, Dr. McNabb and all of the guests. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye, everybody.